Season of Arrivals released in June 2020, and with a two month delay to the Beyond Light expansion, was the longest season of that year, at 154 days. The two lore books we got in this release, The Singular Exegete and Duress and Egress, are a departure from the previous seasons in that they do not cover historical events, but instead were closely integrated with the progression of the story week over week, reflecting the events that happened in game. The release of the Prophecy Dungeon and the Vidoc, and the trailers for the expansion Beyond Light also added to this release, and I've tried to account for their influence in this reading structure. So I've split this episode into three sections with two interludes. Arrivals, Seasonal Story and law Books are separated into those three parts, so part one, two and three, and in between are a section on the Nine and the Prophecy Dungeon, and then another one on the teases and foreshadowing for Beyond Light. There are timestamps and a full list of all the entries used in the description below. I hope you enjoy. Arrival Seasonal Story Part 1 Covering the web law False Idols and Citizens of the City The first few chapters of the books Duress and Egress and the singular Exegete the seasonal artifact, and the in-game interactions from the opening quests of this season. False Idols The High Priest knelt before his withered god, mired in the ambivalence of shattered ideology, his faith replaced by the reality of Zol's failure. No wisdom or debased ritual buried in decrepit tomes could restore what was lost, nor was he inclined to attempt such an act. Disillusion swept over, the will of thousands, silenced by light and code. He would have called this an act of heresy once, when the truth had not yet been revealed. There are no gods. There are only chains, and those at either end. Nocris had been the ignorant staring into the sun, for what is divinity but a star that blinds? A statue to be toppled, that it may galvanize the wailing masses who seek power in the death of old things. Gods broken by pawns, brought low and driven into the mud. Nocris drifted in the heart of winter, at the northern pole of Mars. He lacked the strength to raise what remained frozen beneath the surface. He closed his eyes and reached into the tucked corners of existence with his mind, searching for remnants of Zol's power, only to find his communion denied by months of disconnected indifference. Through his outreach, he had come to know that Zol lived, buried deep and forgotten within the crust of another world. He had grazed the edge of confirmation with his old god, only to feel it wriggle away, apathetic and eager to break ties. Nocris, too weak to fulfil his purpose, was abandoned. The worm sought to be wielded by another to fill their hands with power as self-justified servitude in the bowels of Io. Despite the many traces of Zol's influence remaining on Mars, none would serve him better than the scrap of worm hide he gripped within his claws. He may be unable to produce the death necessary to feed its appetite and coerce paracausal change from it, but he knew those who could foster the necessary violence. A plan began to form in his mind, whispered from deep recesses he had not explored in many years. He had held the scrap taken from Zol's remains for so long that it had eaten grooves into the bone plating on his hand. With it, he intended to force open that which had always been kept from him by the logic of the sword. 
he meant to craft his own ascendant gate from the grave corpse legions of his risen brood. Fetid ranks of thrall rotted beneath rhyme on cracked chitin, encircled him and awaited the ritual. Their refurbished flesh, soul fire kindling. He drew upon the deep and let the latent tethers clinging to Zol's sloth guide his will until he could molt reality around it. The bait was set. Agents of the sky were expected, and so they came with fury and the fuel of death. They did as they were built to do. Obsequious and domineering, they knew no other way but to cleanse that which stood in opposition to their arresting light. Their righteous carnage birthed Nocris's transition, and his snare drew watchful eyes from the taken throne. The sky's vassals stormed the penumbral depths, as they had done many times before. Their fear of Zol's resurrection drove their furor like searing irons at their back. Fear he had twisted to his purpose. His death? An offering that would seal the spell and create a pinprick piercing through which his soul could slip into the Ascendant Plane. But Guile was the language of a more ancient player, and she had taken notice of his cunning. She directed Nocris away from his destination, to instead wash upon the shores of her court. As his vision cleared, his eyes strained to see the Taken Queen, cloaked in the midnight glory of an event horizon. A singularity throne perverted the space before him, the Queen of Lies, wrapped in distortion and gravitational lensing, sat within its inestimable depth. Her voice was distant redshift discord all around him, her presence, the realm itself, boundless and willing to take. Savathun's words spewed forth. Breaker of pacts, a heretic stands here. What denial has yet to be given that you would return to me? I fed the worm, and still it faltered, he said. Nokra stared directly into the empty point of space, continually caving in on its form. He could barely define her silhouette within the wall. To falter is its nature. Savathun's words were tinged in curiosity though not by your efficacious methods. Nocris preened the flesh of his face back to display a skeletal smile. The sword bears no truth. The worms are gods of thin ambition, and reign vast nothing. Brave words in this place. Do you not think they are watching? Nocris bowed his head for the first time since he was drawn here. The queen is clever. You did not share my father's single-minded ambition, nor my brother's taste for glory. You wish to serve me? The thin image twitched within the backlit accretion glow. My life is spent. Servitude to those who cast me away. Our blood is all that remains of the old pact. Then let us make use of each other. Nocris raised his gaze. What use would I be to a god? No gods. He nodded. So it has always been. Savathun's voice converged onto him from every direction. You a usurper, the first tug at the end of the chain. To act as distraction or wait a slaughter? Nocris's voice sunk with disappointment. No, as a thorn, you have circumvented the deep through forbidden sacrament, 
and so you shall continue. The deep fears me, as we feared you. Ignorance keeps, knowledge usurps. In this you have found purpose in my court. The high priest's shoulders straightened. You feared me? In a younger time, intents were narrower. I see your value, as we should have then. All who denied you, blinded by the sword, let them fall away as grains from the sight. I am the implement. You are the mechanism by which we sever their chain. Savathun's voice filled his skull with silken promise. Teach me your necromancies, usurper of the ordered way, so that together we may circumvent the anchored logic that drags us into the depths. Serve as foil to scatter the pieces of their grand game across the cosmos. As Zol did for my heart, I offer a trade. Knowledge for knowledge. Grant me sight into the dreaming mind's talent, and I will teach what you ask. A rebellious bargain in the midst of dark tides. It is bound. Under my symbol, reborn and made in my image, our bargain will set new beginnings in motion. The masters convene here. Concern dripped from Nocris's words. Do we mean to move against them? Not so directly. Arrival is imminent. A shadow will reach out and make itself known. I am to obscure the connection. Where sky meets deep, you shall be the screen that sows dissonance. And for it, we will walk unhindered by the parasitic inclinations of those who believe themselves mighty. Nocris saw the scheme. The will of many bent to our hand. No longer do they draw upon us. Freedom. They are beset against each other. We will walk the space between. An accord is struck. Speak my name. Savathun, subjugant to none, swordbreaker and queen to the taken throne. To me you are bonded. Go forth and enact my will. Nocris was cast out of Savathun's court as suddenly as he had been ripped into her presence. He drifted in the ascendant plane, no longer directionless. Behind him the court faded and its shimmering illusion fell like curtains upon a stage. The dark core of the singularity wavered, sunken within its gravitational well was a lone thrall and no other. Its death spread over eons of deterioration, mouth agape to utter words at the taken queen's whim as Patsy and nothing more. Her presence had been but a mirage, soaked and sold by the lie of her mouthpiece puppet to whom Nocris unknowingly spoke. In truth, only a thrall stood within the orbit of the singularity, but the queen would not be so foolish to reveal herself. Savathun looked upon her charlatan court from distant transcendent hollows. Her nascent alliance had produced power twinfold, in that of Nocris's devotion, as well as his deception through her mouthpiece thrall positioned within the singularity. She breathed in his desperate agreement and prepared for the struggle to come. At the outset of the season, Eris Morn briefly recaps the outcome of the Shadowkeep expansion 
before an opening cutscene plays out, in which Anna Bray witnesses the Warmind Rasputin's response to the arrival of the Pyramid Fleet, and its unstoppable counterattack. The Hive wanted a return to war on the moon. They built a lunar fortress to back their assault. A grand stage to announce their revival. You climbed that scarlet citadel, and the Hive met you head on. You buried them. But we found more than Hive on the moon. The Dark has reached out. We have no choice but to reach back. The shadow of a pyramid appears over Jupiter and its moon Io. On Mars, Anna watches Rasputin's holographic projections. They display the Pyramid Fleet's arrival, before representing the Warmind's arsenal being turned on the invading force. The attack is ineffective, and Rasputin is knocked offline. Duress and Egress. Anna prayed. She had tried everything. The Great Bray, a lineage that promised to save them. For all her genius and moxie, this was beyond her. Rasputin lay dying in a dozen empty screens splayed out around Anna's command station. She could visualize the bleeding code running through her fingers. Zavala's voice was in her ear as ambient haze, relegated to the background of her mind like distant gunfire. The image of the pyramid's distortion wave was still raw. This wasn't an attack, it was a command, a lazy dismissal of all their best laid plans. There were no explosions, no blaring sirens or sparks of dramatic electricity. Nothing to combat or fix. Just a guardian, walled in silent black glass and disbelief. She had been so sure. Anna's eyes tracked Jinju as the ghost sped from console to console, attaching strings of light to each. They slowed her as she went, buried under some load. Anna... Jinju's voice strained under crushing distortion. I think I've got him. M most of him, but not for long. The words cut through the distant gunfire. What? Anna asked. Her voice came softly at first, unsure what form to take as the information processed. What? Jinju groaned and whispered an exasperated, Hillary Engram. It's not ready. Anna, no. He'll go insane. I can't. The light tethers attached to Jinju began to pop one by one. It's this or nothing. The prospect sent Anna tearing across the room. She belted a command into the air, and a floor safe opened in response. 
Anna snatched the dodecahedron enclosure from the safe and braced it in front of Jinju. Jinju, do it! The ghost shell reformed to forge a directing structure before her core erupted with light and data. A stream of pure information beamed into the engram, filling it with spiralling wisps of light. Did you... as much as I could? Outside the windows, bolts of atmospheric friction dragged flames through the sky as warsats plummeted from low-orbit defensive positions. Their impacts were distant. Hollow words. Type. Spliced feed. Audio. Rasputin has been neutralized. What that means, exactly? Time will tell. A glorious tragedy. May it rise to fight again. I trust you have another plan, Commander? Hopefully a more effective plan? The hostility is unnecessary, Jalal. We are here to devise a plan. We had one. It was rejected. The time for that is long past. Your plan was to leave the Traveller. We are unprepared because we waste time debating. We were prepared by every conflict that befell the city. This war has been written in the stars. Let it come. Mobilize the fleet. We have guns enough. Surely that option would please Lakshmi. Yes. The fire from your guns would have ricocheted off the Almighty's hull. How do you plan to wound the pyramid? This was settled during the Red War. It has not changed. We will need the fleet in reserve, should the situation turn dire. We will not flee the seat of our Golden Age. Enact wartime powers. A monarch must be chosen. How long has that omen been left buried on the moon? If the commander had given new monarchy access, instead of allowing that mystic to... Cryptarchs have been attempting to pass the lunar site data feed for months. It is digitized madness. Are the war mines weapons operational? No. They cannot act independently. So then there is nothing. When Rasputin fell, a hidden agent was dispatched to investigate the pyramid's nature and divine its intent. They are supported by Guardian operatives. They will work to contain the darkness, while we evacuate nearby assets and evaluate engagement strategies. In our haste to act, we were caught flat-footed. When we choose to strike again, we must be sure of its efficacy. We may only get one chance. You have all brought wisdom to this meeting. I have considered your counsel. Executor, I request the new monarchy support us as they did so graciously when the Red Legion struck. Organize the movement of our people and coordinate with Soraya Hawthorne's contacts to secure them within the walls. Cousin Jalal, I request dead orbit ships bury the wayward home and provide transit security. In return, you will both be granted full access to the Vanguard's lunar site resources. A late invitation, Commander, but acceptable. For the time being, Dead Orbit will protect caravans and aid in relocation. Good. Lakshmi, Project Stronghold will require additional printings. Ada Wan has agreed to lend her equipment and her expertise to assist in this endeavor. Is this satisfactory? The future war cult's forges are ready and eager. We request to assist the Bray in evaluating damage to the war mine. Offer the help. Anna will accept it, I'm sure, so long as you defer to her oversight. Her standing is tenuous. We believe it's amicable to offer partnership, not support. 
You may suggest as much. Do we have a consensus? Many voices pledge in agreement. Adjourned. Nondescript shuffling and chatter. Door closing. Silence. You offer too much. They want all the sway and none of the responsibility. Let them have both. Now is not the time to tangle ourselves in political conflicts. It won't be long before they realize Eris is the agent in question. She should be warned. I'll reach out to her. Dress and Egress. Asher, Observation. Man of science though he was, the first thing Ashamir did was shoot the damn thing. The pyramid hovered inside Ayo's atmosphere, close enough to be impacted by a projectile flung at sufficient speed. In the time it took Asher to blink twice, he knew the angle of attack and the mass of the projectile. Asher finished building the mounted railgun before his coffee had cooled. He charged the magnetic coils, waited for the wind to die down, and broadsided the ship. He had expected the projectile to hit a kinetic barrier, or best case scenario, impact the pyramid and cause utterly infinitesimal damage. Instead, at the moment of impact, the projectile stopped existing. Asher's brow furrowed, while an irrepressible smile crept over his face. His metal arm clicked and hummed gently of its own accord. The pyramid had the audacity to park in front of his laboratory and pull such a cheap trick. Clearly, it had not thought it would meet Ashamir. He assembled another missile, one with a detectable radiation signature and a radio signal. He fired it at the pyramid. It similarly disappeared on impact, its signal snuffed out, no longer detectable from Io's surface. Another payload followed. This one, a miniature relay station. He routed it through his console and fired. At the moment it touched the pyramid, it transmitted a spike of radiation and radio broadcast. Asher smirked. They were still there, held in the field of the pyramid, visually undetectable, signal squelched, but still physically there. How the pyramid was accomplishing this feat was unimportant at the moment, though his mind flooded with fantasies of zero-point energy. The question that gave him pause was the what. What was the ship doing to the projectiles as they sat suspended in space in the periphery of its loathsome shape? And why? A shadow overhead. As alluded to by Zavala in the entry for Hollow Words, the Guardian has been sent to Io to search for Eris Moore. The day we've been dreading has finally arrived. The darkness is here. We need boots on the ground on Io. Recon. There's a pyramid. It's already disabled Rasputin. I'd lean on Eris's expertise, but we haven't been able to reach her. We both know what that means. Eris is our best chance at understanding what we're up against. I need her at the tower. She's too valuable an asset to... Find her, Guardian. Bring her home. Eris Morn, a guardian without a ghost. I wonder how that must feel, hollow, unnatural, when I look at that ship. Eris, can you hear us? Eris. Nothing. Zavala, come in. Any sign? My signals are being suppressed. I can't even summon a sparrow. What do you see? The pyramid. It's... Oppressive. Like a storm building. Then be quick. 
Get out ahead of it. Understood. The Guardian is pulled towards the pyramid. No! No! Don't! You bring weapons. You will not need them. We offer only truth. We will have. Something pulled us out of the beam. What's happening? What is this place? The Guardian was diverted to the Ascendant Plane, but is transported back to Io. We're back on Io. Close to the cradle. I'm... I'm getting faint readings from Eris now. Let's keep moving. The air down here is choked with strange communications. I don't know if I can... Is that you, Guardian? You're needed back at the tower. Zavala sent us. Of course he did. I'm moving toward the cradle. It calls to me. It? What is it? The hive are frenzied. Proven. Zavala, did you catch that? This interference. I can't triangulate a point of origin. Keep going. Maybe the signal is better up ahead. Guardian, your assistance would not be unwelcome! There are forces at play here I do not fully understand. The hive! We need to move. All channels. Is anyone there? Eris, talk to us. Say something. Please. The Guardian enters the cradle where a huge tree, entirely silver, dominates. As they approach, they are pulled back into the Ascendant Plane. Specifically, the Court of Savathun. Something pulled us back in. It's keeping us from Eris. The Guardian encounters envoys of Savathun and is surrounded. There are too many of them. Enough! Eris transports the Guardian back to the cradle. You're hurt. It is nothing. But this... This is something. A tree of silver wings. It grew from the last place the Traveler touched before it left this world. The darkness was drawn here. As the hive is drawn to the darkness. These eyes of mine. The things they have seen. What was that? Something that does not want us here. Darkness. No. But it is of the darkness. It has to be you this time. The Guardian approaches Eris and picks up a seed from the Tree of Silver Wings. Come in. We hear you, Zavala. Have you found her? The seed breaks through the interference. Eris. Zavala. Report back to me in the tower, both of you. Our transmissions may be compromised. Let's not keep him waiting, Guardian.
argument. Eris makes a report of her findings to Zavala, and the Guardian receives new instructions. What did you find? It found me. The darkness reached out, but something interferes. Its messages to us are being defaced. Defaced? By the witch sister of the Taken King, Oryx. Savathun. Your obsession gives her power. No. She feeds on denial. Ignorance. The Guardian has discovered a means to circumvent her. A seed of silver wings. There is... If the darkness reaches out, we must reach back. I will not sanction this. We are beyond sanctions. It is here. I will return to Io. If we cannot determine what the darkness seeks, we will find ourselves on the verge of a second collapse. Perhaps that is what Savathun wants. Please, don't. Let me go, Zavala. Where were we? According to spectral analysis, the pyramid, its propulsion, the energy it's manipulating on Io, I don't see a ship. I see a being. Paracausal in nature. Like the Traveler. All records of the Golden Age agree. On the first day, the sky filled with darkness. On the second, the Traveler fell. Help Eris where you can, but be ready to deal with the enemy fleet when it arrives. We need you, Guardian. Seed of silver wings, malleable and hungering, speak not of what it becomes. GST encoded, sender, mystic. GST encoded, recipient 1, gallant, recipient 2, scribe. To our little trio, I write out of concern and independently, my findings. I sense the tension brimming at the forefront of our correspondences, and I feel the need to again impress upon you the gravity of our current standing. I understand the vanguard's position. Contact has been made. I have felt it. I cannot ignore it, nor can I purge it. That much you should know. It is not a temptation. It is not a disease. It is an appeal to reason. I know you see the worth. Long have the Thanatonauts delved into these questions. Where they went, I simply walk a parallel road. Do not abandon me in this. There is little time and it may be all we have left. Now, Ikora, to the matter of your inquiry, thank you for that, by the way. That you would not come yourself, I will say nothing. There is a second tree, obviously. It has grown, and from it, the Guardian has taken a seed that we intend to use for study. With the tree's parent felled in the Black Garden, this may be a rarely given opportunity. I am only now beginning to record its most lightly guarded secrets. It is fluid in nature. No, Asher, not physically. It acts as an engine of integration, incorporating that which it contacts into its structure. It feeds from paracausal energy. The light. The dark. 
They are vying for dominance within its every particle. I wonder whether we are meant to enact a second unveiling. Whether this is meant to be a peeling away of an existence nurtured within its bark. One in which we may play out the paths that are yet to come. There are many answers, but the question remains. By whom was it planted? I hope this message finds you in good health and less pain. I look forward to your thoughts. To the gallant, the mystic, the scribe, may our bond hold strong. Ever sworn, Eris Moore. Citizens of the City. Social Graces. A quiet dusk settles, revealing cinder orange blankets within bands of receding blue sky as shadows spill from the western wall. Congregations under the streetlights that were brought on by the Almighty's destruction had slowly died down since the arrival of the Black Fleet, their revelry laid to rest in tombs of speculated dread and anxiety. Titans reinforce aging sections of the wall and patrol the streets. Hunters form recon fire teams and slink into the surrounding wilderness, keeping tabs on enemy movements spurred by the arrival as the cover of night materializes above them. Warlocks gather en masse in the stone gardens beneath the traveller in a desperate meditation, scouring their light for signs. The remnants of socialite resistance steal away to shelters of any kind. A handful of ornery citizens still find refuge above ground, in Rainpier's drunken noodle ramen bar. A few patrons sit behind the massive glass window, and the glow of the drunken noodle signage, complete with neon bowl, fills the far wall. Beyond there, Shuttered shops loom silently over the shoulders of a patrolling titan. The ramen shop stands alone, alive in a faint glow and the wafting scent of hot broth that press back the depression of nightfall. Lockdown after lockdown, I'm sick of curfews, Frank sighs. I understood it for the almighty, but this? The commander will handle it, Rainpier says and leans over the bar counter, refilling glasses and bowls with sustenance. Please, Frank's voice is thick with sarcasm. I don't see a ship crashing down anymore, do you? He did it before, and he'll do it again. Distant melancholy hymns ebb and flow outside as the voice of a chorus rises beneath the waves of music. A young woman named Miley speaks up from a secluded corner table. Zavala's a politician. What's he going to say? People of the city, you're all going to die. She shifts in her chair. He rolled the dice on the Almighty and got bailed out. Guardians didn't do squat. Oh yeah? Big talk from someone living in their walls, under their traveller. Jean, an old regular, calls back. I was born here, ma'am. The title drips with derision. And now there ain't anywhere else left to go. Miley snipes. Used to be, wasn't anywhere to go. Period. Jean says and glares. Frank nods at Miley. Look, Guardians have had years and years, and we're still stuck in one spot. They're just in it for glory. They love running around on their little missions, playing hero. He leans back and speaks loudly. Listen to how Shax yells up from their tower. Not one word about the little guy. Rainpier cuts in. Frank. You'd be dead in two seconds out there. And Miley? Your mother was coughing up blood before, 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 before. It's the same words coming out of all you geezers. 
you're also caught up talking about before. What about now? Marley asks and slaps her hand down on her table. The not-so-distant chorus turns onto the drunken noodle street. Deeper tones of their hymn, now full and symphonic with the backing of a hundred voices, bleed into a funeral dirge. Several of the restaurant patrons, as well as Rainpeer, crane to see the procession. Dead orbit freaks. Travellers done good by us. Some of you don't appreciate what you have. Jeed interjects. I'm with Miley. Guardians aren't here for us. Travellers looking out for itself. Legion hit us and it didn't do jack until its life was on the line. Frank says. He stares at his bowl before turning to view the procession through the window. It just sat there, while our homes burned. I lost my son on Titan. We don't even have his body. A host of citizens led by a crier in dead orbit black flow down the stone road. The crier's voice is crisp as they call for unity. Speaking of warnings unheeded, pleading for the like-minded to join the procession, promising hope, seeking to shepherd others to the intangible beyond. Rainpeer refills Frank's glass with mead. We all mourned Henry with you, Frank. It's crisis after crisis, living scared and losing. This place was supposed to be safe. Instead, we've all paid. It's time the Traveller pulls its weight, Miley says, riding the wave of Frank's frustration. Her argument is interrupted by the commotion outside, where a guardian watches over the procession from the opposite side of the street. She does not flinch as a hurled bottle shatters against her helmet. Spit. Glass and stinging words. Her weapons remain slung, her ghost concealed. The dirge wanes and moves on. Rainpeer breaks the eerie hold first. The Traveller will. They all will. We're here, aren't we? They won the city back, he points through the window. They brought a man back from the dead. Death doesn't mean anything to them. They never suffer the consequences, and you expect them to understand what it feels like. Frank exhales, voice tremoring. You're talking out your ass. Saint 14. When I was a girl, he was like a giant. He could do anything. He would do anything to help. You don't know how it was. Guardians will get it done, Jean says and crosses her arms. We'll see, Miley replies, slurping through a mouth half full of noodles. Quiet night settles back in the ramen bar's atmosphere. Warmth soothes unrest. The shrill violin stroke fades. Glad we got that out. Rainpeer thumps a fist against the counter twice. He looks at his patrons' grave faces. Sake? In the face of darkness, the Guardian checks in with the Drifter, who is repurposing his banks from Gambit to collect and contain the darkness energies emanating from the pyramids. Big Boss Blue said you were coming. Offered me some made-up job. Plugging the pyramids leaks, keeping the dark bottled up. Said it was compulsory. I don't mind a little charity, but you ask me, containment's just like holding your breath. Gotta let it out every now and then. Pyramids are making some moves. Moon Dust thinks we can use the darkness we catch to charge that seed. Might cut through all that pesky interference in the cradle. Might let her tell you what Savathun doesn't want you to know. Good thing, too, cause it is wacky out there. <laughs> Look around. 
cabal, the fallen, a bunch of unsavory types looking to stake their claim. Jokers can't even see we're boxed in. All bets on you to pull through. <laughs> Contact Io. The contact seasonal activity required guardians to harvest darkness using the Drifter's Bank from enemy factions. In the contact public event, a variety of voice lines trigger at several stages. I have selected a few that occur on joining and completing the activity, as well as when taken blockers sent by Savathun arrive and at the point of heroic event activation. Curious to hear what they have to say. Remember what they've done. Be careful. Your big blue boss looks rattled, brother. I'd be worried. Commander Zabala has far more to orchestrate than a back alley brawl. Rat. All right. All right. Just looking out. Guardian. Savathun's clutches tighten if we hesitate. Hey, those aren't my taking. Get them off my gear. Something big's moving in. The witch cream's wretched marionette. And upon its tongue, her violent regards. It did not take them long to arrive once the undying mind was slain. They were close, bearing witness, perched along our borders with patient determination. And we did nothing. You have moved us forward, and yet my mind rests on one thought. Why not simply press us at the city? Do they suspect such an act would awaken the Traveler? We must find answers. Inspiring heroics. I'm all riled. I didn't take you as the type to swoon. Kid reminds me of Wei Ni. Nothing wrong with a little white hat every now and then. She was a treasure. You knew her? Had to pay her tab a few times. Cleared me out. She did possess great ambition. Vanguard came to me pretty quick when they couldn't find Osiris. Hmm. Should have heard the offers I turned down. Is that so? Of all the vaults in the city, none held any value for you? That's the problem with you guardians. So materialistic. And yet here you are. Keeping my ear to the ground. Got a visitor. Again. Hey, cue ball. Got some time to kill? I was passing by. Not checking in on anyone? No. Someone special? Send me a report. Today. In the face of darkness, the Guardian finds an umbral engram during the containment activities and returns it to the Drifter. He introduces us to his Umbral Decoder, which had a number of fun voice lines that helped bring some levity to an otherwise often somber season. Putting this thing together was easy. Getting it to record my voice was the hard part. Isn't this thing cool? It's like Rahul, but better. Hope you brought me some darkness. This bank is hungry. Yum, 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 yum. Interference. Protected. With the seed charged by completing contact events, the Guardian returns to the cradle to drive off Savathun and Nocris's forces. 
who are trying to prevent contact between the Darkness fleet and humanity. The Guardian goes through the process of dispelling interference each time they visit Eris for another communication sent by the Darkness. When they fight through the Taken Realm, the Hive, Necromancer, Nocris has a number of lines that can play. The servants of Savathun fight to keep us from the messages of darkness. Use the seeds to dispel their foul influence. An agent of violence. What more must you call? Is malice not enough? You are abandoned. Cast off your poor, your tiny ball of six, your dreaded anchor that drags to the sky. Worm, speak for yourself. Well done, Guardian. I will interpret the Darkness's messages as best I can. Although this particular form of communication is... logographic, composed of evocative glyphs. Metaphors, really. For example, this message. This word could mean protected, but it is loaded with subtext. There are connotations of blithe authoritarian forces, unshakable in their faith. The translation sheltered would not be sinister enough. Perhaps... Gelded. Clearly the darkness does not believe the Traveler to be as benevolent as we do. Continue your efforts. We have much to learn. Singular Exegy. Protected. Report by Vannet Encrypted Router. Reference obvious. The enemy insinuates that we are hobbled by the Traveler's protection. Denied our full potential. This is expected. Our foe comprehends only violence and its beauty. Personal notes. Scratched in hive leather with a flake of Ionian stone. The tired insinuation that protection is weakness. I expected more from our great foe. When we hunted the first trespasser on the moon, I discovered the journal of a Golden Age commander. Huan Xuan had faith and training. Still, the darkness seduced her. And this? Is the insidious power that turned her against her god? I am learning to cook. I salvaged a hot plate back on the moon. It was vacuum welded to the countertop, and I had to cut it free. My hands ache, but they are steadier. Cousin Asher, you would find the concept of vacuum welding upsetting. Press two sheets of metal together in void, and their atoms cannot tell which sheet they belong to. They cross freely. The two become one. I sleep beside an intruding pyramid. I am deep in its shadow. Back in the tower, beneath the traveler, could they understand how I am vacuum welded to the enemy? Ikora would understand. She studied the Taken with me despite the risks, and Zavala values foresight. But he also fears the next Lysander, the next Toland, the next Rezal Azir. He fears what I could teach his guardians. He is weary of being the one to say no when all his guardians shout yes, yes. But... It is his duty, and he loves when duty hurts. Forceful, angled cuts. I am afraid. I am afraid that if I go on, I will lose everything I have regained, all my peace, all my trust, all my hopes, 
and I will even destroy my dear friend who fights where I cannot. A blank space. I need to make a walk. I am going to take an angle grinder to the rotor disc from an old rover. I must find cooking oil to season it. I will search through cousin's old caches tomorrow. Tonight, I cook fried rice. Rice and raisins will come from my stores. The recipe calls for pine apple. Is this a joke? Pine flavoured apple. I will substitute breadfruit if I can find it. Interference. Eggshell. Eris deciphers a second message from the Pyramid Fleet. This is a simple message. Eggshell. The term carries all the impermanence and fragility you would expect. The darkness sees the Traveler as something keeping us isolated from the outside world. It is a barrier we are meant to outgrow and break through. Singular Exegete Eggshell Report by Vannet Encrypted Router. The bird cannot fly until it leaves the eggshell. The enemy continues to suggest that we must abandon the traveller. This is a good sign. It would not need to entice us if it could destroy us without effort. Personal notes. Scored in hive leather with a knife. Tidal volcanism and Jupiter's plasma breath made Io into a treasure trove of chemistry for the traveller's work. A good wok must be seasoned in the same way. I am heating it with sunflower oil from Cousin Ash's cache. There were many fine things, all untouched. He denies himself. I ache from the hike. Ikora says I am full of hairline fractures and deep muscle trauma. I never noticed until other pains had healed. The illusions of recovery. One pain obscures another. There is danger in this traffic with the pyramid. Juan Xuan's logs make that plain. But I must continue. I must continue. What worth have I ever been except that I know the enemy? More worth, Mara would remind me. I am more than my uses. So, what bird would we become if we left the Traveller behind? There are obvious examples. We might survive as raiders on the edge. We might abandon our humanity for machines. We might rise up in war and build an empire. Yet none of these can be the answer. Fallen, Vex, Cabal and Hive all covet the Traveller. They have not left it behind. If all things beyond the Traveller's protection fall under the suzerainty of darkness, not because they serve it, but because they are obedient to its law, then to leave the Traveller would be to join the enemy. There would be no other way. Even so, I am proof otherwise. I move between. There is not only grey between black and white. All the colours are there. And am I not necessary? I would be lost without those who led me back to the light. But if I had not been there to guide them down into darkness, they would all be dead. Who would we become if we were all like Eris Morn? Ah, my what is on fire. Duress and Egress Asher 
Prediction. Ashamir cursed his way across Io. As he picked his way across the rocky outcrop, he cursed the loose soil underfoot, cursed his oversized pack, cursed the roving taken, cursed the kick of his silicone Naroma rifle against his shoulder. He looked up at the pyramid, funneling its foul energies down into the cradle, and sneered. Well read as he was, he didn't have the energy to arrange the required words. It was late during what passed for night on Io, and while Asher was tired, he hiked on diligently. He stopped only once, briefly, to study a snail whose shell was growing tiny clusters of crystalline black obelisks. He crept down through the cavernous spaces beneath the cradle. Unfamiliar roots protruded from the earthen walls. He calmly observed the pattern of a twitching shrieker, and his calculated ricochet sent a band of Taken roaring down the wrong pathway. He passed unmolested. Eris was in her meagre camp near the twisted roots of the enormous tree. She knelt near a beam of light coming from far above, which filtered through the pith of the tree to strike an unnatural splash of cambium petals. Asher noticed the smells of sap and burned cooking oil. She said she was pleased to see him, though when she sought to clarify the cadence of his supply drops, he felt she might be put off by the unexpected visit. As he unpacked what he had brought her, she explained the tree, the messages, the whispers, the thrilling struggle to glimpse the face of the unknown, even if that unknown may be trying to kill you. He was smiling as she spoke. Asha understood exactly what she meant. He rested by the fire. Nearby was a small table that held samples of hive chitin, clippings from the tree, ashy soil, and an open notebook that Asha saw was a personal journal, which he quickly flipped shut with distaste. He reached again into his pack. He brought forth a bottle of fine golden spirits. From when some towering ignoramus misunderstood his request for isopropyl alcohol, and placed it on the table. He had brought two clean glasses, nestled ridiculously in the boxy shipping case of a large graduated cylinder. He removed one and placed it gently next to the bottle. Asher coughed, relaced his boots, then stood and shouldered his pack. You have things taken care of, yes? he said to Eris. Certainly, she said, intent on the beam of swirling light. He shifted and made a little noise in his throat. I need to know that things will be taken care of, he said clearly. Eris looked over and considered the man standing across from her. To the best of my ability, she finally said. Asher nodded and began his long walk back. Interference White Eris deciphers the third message from the Pyramid Fleet. This construction is white. Not like the color, but the absence of color. An indistinct void, overexposed sameness of a thing long dead. The white of bleached bone of the Traveler. Singular Exegete White Report by Van Net Encrypted Router The color white exists as a symbol of uniformity, sterility, and sameness. In light, there is only death. The same message VIP 2014 received in the Lunar Pyramid. Again, uninteresting. Personal notes scored in hive leather with a knife. I do not believe the darkness has returned to destroy the Traveler. Surely it could have done that while the Traveler was maimed and stranded. 
Why wait for a sign that the light had returned to its strength? Perhaps the darkness has returned for us. Guardians are the Traveler's final memorial. We are its selfless legacy and last argument. The color white. Stasis. Blankness. Bone. Flag of truce. This is an opportunity. We must do as we did before, encounter the enemy's power, learn what we can, and report back. And if we return with nothing but beautiful and violent words, then we will study them as scripture, and find some way to turn the enemy's power to our use, just as it wishes to turn us to its purpose. My walk is filthy with burnt oil. I need baking soda to clean it, but there is none on Io. Instead, I bubbled carbon dioxide through sodium hydroxide. It burnt like hive blood, and retrieved enough soda to clean the walk. While I was scrubbing, a young guardian approached. She had an ancient name, Akkadian, perhaps, or Sumerian. She said that she had heard of me, and she wanted to help me search for knowledge. I snapped at her to bring me a pine apple. I know I was cruel. Duress and Egress Anna, Physics Zavala set down two glasses. He watched Anna's face as he poured velvet-looking liquor and filled them. Her eyes were focused on the grains of his death, how, to the unobservant, they would fade away into the greater canvas of wood, indistinguishable from each other. The traveller hung behind him, buried in a darkening cloud, a part of, and a part from the sky. I can't believe we lost, she said. We are not lost. Zavala pushed a glass toward Anna. I froze. We still don't even know what. If we saved anything, she said. It's not so easy to act in the face of defeat. The prospect of a future is something we have to keep in mind. Anna glared at Zavala. Nothing we do is supposed to be easy. Isn't that the point? This was a stress test, and I buckled. Faith, Anna. You reminded me that we wrap ourselves in the doubt of past failures. Without you, the city would be ash and rubble more than once. Anna scooped the glass into her hand. She smelled the liquor, winced, and placed it back on the table. You believed in me. Rasputin was my job. Yes, and he still is. A job for the future, Zavala said and sipped his drink. Now we have a new job. Eris needs our support. Tell me everything isn't over. When Cade passed, I saw the fracturing of the Vanguard as a path toward inevitable failure. Still, it has proved impossible to fill his seat. I believed I would be too weak to lead without the balance added by his unique perspective. As it turns out, his life was but one in an eternity of choices. Zavala, I don't want... Relax, I'm not offering you the job. Unless you killed Cade, and we've had the wrong man this whole time. If I did, would you forgive me? I'd understand, he said and smiled. Ikora told me back then that an object in motion stays in motion. I've always admired the phrase, but I must admit, it can be difficult to adhere to. 
Anna shook her head. That's just physics. A fundamental aspect of life. He watched Anna's mood lighten as she considered his words. We find the footholds we can, and make the best step given the ground we have before us. Anna nodded. Whatever happened to Cade's chicken? Zavala sighed. I believe Saint has anointed it as some sort of pigeon lord. Anna's locked jaw melted into a smile. Life does not wait for us, no matter how long we live it. Drink your drink, Zavala chuckled, his glass to his face, before the Lord of Pigeons summons us to attack the pyramids. Interference Cusp Eris deciphers the fourth message from the pyramid. This word denotes the moment before a change, the cusp, the brink. But it is a repetition of something that has already happened. A mistake from which no knowledge was gained. A collapse. Perhaps. Troubling. Singular exegete. Cusp. Report by VanNet Encrypted Router. This is a threat. The enemy implies we are on the edge of a second collapse. There are intimations of a repeated mistake. An error we will make again. Perhaps it is a demand for surrender. Personal notes, scratched in high of leather with a flake of Ionian stone. The collapse was a murder. A genocide. Why does the enemy imply it was our error? I was born long after the Golden Age, but I do feel loyalty to that time and compassion. Humanity thought it was immortal. So did I once. What should we have learned from the collapse? That we are weak? Obvious and false? No that we made errors in our defence. Our enemy is not a strategy instructor. No. That everything grown must die, hope is futile, etc. Tiresome. Death may be inevitable, but life is worth fighting for to protect and extend. No. That the traveller is using us for its own ends then why would it sacrifice itself? No. That the darkness is not our enemy. It is only the Traveller's enemy. Does the enemy suggest we should have turned on the Traveller during the collapse? Cracked it like an egg? I see shades of the prisoner's dilemma that occupied Quan Shren. If Traveller and humanity cooperate, both suffer. If humanity maims the Traveller as it tries to flee, both are destroyed. But if the Traveller chooses to help us, and we turn against it, offer it to the enemy. The enemy suggests this would have been our salvation. For now, I subsist on thick pemmican and vitamin paste. I crave fresh food. I must invite someone to share this meal I will someday cook. My palate is... toughened. I will need a taster. Perhaps I should not have sent the Sumerian woman away. Citizens of the City. Refuge. Dead orbit ships sweep away the clouds around the Traveller, as midnight approaches. He keeps his ring by the door, in case he has to leave. He only keeps one magazine loaded, but loose brass rounds fill the gaps inside the go-bag under the coat rack. If they hit, they'll come here. 
That's what she always says. Right here. But Lisa was born here, and she hadn't been out there, like he had. He doesn't know if they can leave before that happens. Gravity dragged them back here twice before. Two failed excursions, though they were solitary exercises. Surely the world would kick them back again, just like it always did. Third time's the charm. You'll have me. And we'll have one of the free capitals. Lightless and away from all this. Her latest appeal to leave. The free capitals are just rumours. Buried cave cities that predate the Golden Age. He had listened to patrons in his brother's ramen house sling stories back and forth over mead and sake. No one has been there. Everyone has met someone who knows someone who has a story about where these cities are. But there had to be other people out there. After all, they came to the city from somewhere. He's sure there are other somewheres out there. Without so much noise. Quiet. All day, there was nothing. And he can't get it out of his head. He needs something to fill the void that isn't talking. Or is at least talking about something that doesn't matter. Every person, every wave band station, is just an opinionated jukebox of the same 20 tunes. Skyward eyes. A bilious wave creeps over his stomach. Equilibrium flexes. His vision goes concave for a moment, like a singularity pinching at four points deep in the sky. Is the ground moving? Gone. He rubs his eyes until his vision runs blurry. Everything is normal. He wants to walk through the trees outside to where the firebreakers make their stand, to clear his mind. There is too much noise. Hunters come and go, returning bloodied with alarming frequency. Future war cultists welcome offloading refugees to the final battle with wide smiles. Fewer caravans appear. It's mostly jump ships now, dead orbit over the tower hangar. His mother used to tell him the Guardians held the city at Six Fronts. They held at Twilight Gap, and they will hold so long as we still have hope in them. They wouldn't lose to this. They wouldn't leave to this. Third time's the charm. Prophecy of the Nine I've included in this section a few selected pre-Shadow Keep grimoire and lore entries relevant to the story of the Nine before it dives into the items released in this season. I've included the entries for the Solstice armor sets here, given their topic is relevant to the Prophecy Dungeon, before proceeding to include a selection of Prophecy Dungeon voice lines, and then reading the armor tabs. Agent of the Nine. Zer sells objects of legendary power. He accepts his own currency in service of his own enigmatic goals, or those of equally cryptic masters. Mysterious, too, is the nature of his presence in the tower. Does he have some arrangement with the Vanguard or the Speaker? Are there those among the Guardian elite who understand Zer's nature and ultimate purpose? Or have all efforts to control his comings and goings simply failed? Ghost Fragment Legends 2 9 The Nine are survivors of the Cis Jovian colonies who made a compact with an alien force to ensure their own survival. The Nine 
are deep orbit war mines who weathered the collapse in hardened stealth platforms. The Nine are ancient Leviathan intelligences from the seas of Europa or the hydrocarbon pits of Titan. The Nine arrived in a mysterious transmission from the direction of the Corona Borealis supercluster. The Nine are the firstborn awoken and their minds now race down the field lines of the Jupiter Io flux tube. The Nine are ghosts who'd pierced the deep black without a ship and meditated on the hissing silence of the heliopause. The Nine are the aspects of the darkness, broken by the Traveler's rebuke, working to destroy us from within. The Nine is a viral language of pure meaning. The Nine are the shadows left by the annihilation of a transcendent shape burned into the weft of what is. Ghost Fragment Ishtar Sink The box appears to be copper. The red lid is dented, one hinge shattered. Inside waits a small quantity of the finest driest powder, more brown than grey, more blue than green. The greatest minds in creation make quick work of the material. The powder is weighed by the grain and studied close and remembered. One hundred billion bits of near nothing reside inside the copper box, all of them tiny and nearly spherical, all etched with the outlines of continents and islands and ice caps. Each sphere represents a planet, and some of these tiny globes match known worlds. There is one Earth, and one Mars, and a Venus too. The box holds renderings of every habitable world in the galaxy. One of them offers a simple explanation. The box is a message. The message is the minuscule nature of the box's cargo. It is the image of 100 billion worlds barely filling two hands. But if so, who is delivering this message? What vastness do they wish to impress on us? Is it a warning? Or an invitation? Or a taunt? Dust. The Red Box. Is that him? Lavinia whispers. Oh yeah. Nobody does unnervingly bewildered like our boy Zer. The Titan points down into the shadows of the tower hangar, where a cloaked figure hunches over nothing, as if run through by an invisible spear. He comes here to trade. We didn't let him in, but we don't stop him either. Lavinia, as afraid of success as she is of failure, shivers through a thrill of nerves. Zer, she corrects the titan. Then, feeling like a pedant, sorry, cryptarch habit. Right, Zer, that's, that's what I said, the titan shrugs. I like old stuff too, cryptarch. Go ask your question. Lavinia's mother told her that on the day of her birth, a witch pronounced her lucky. She will have to trust in that luck now. She descends to the hangar floor and walks determinedly up to the thing. It does not even lift its hood to look. Zer, she says, unsure what to do with her hands. I'm Cryptarch Lavinia Garcia Umir Tawil. I've chosen to study the Nine. As all fools do, her master told her. I want to ask you a question. You have no need of it. The voice hidden in that squirming face is a man's, low and incongruously clear. He sounds, Lavinia thinks, as if he is trying very earnestly, very hard, 
to be understood. But I will give it to you. She has practiced this question, clung to it as her anchor when she drifted away from her master and friends. We salvaged information from a ghost on Venus, in the Ishtar Sink. It described an artifact found by our Golden Age ancestors. A copper box, painted red, lightly damaged, full of dust. On the individual motes of dust, we found engraved maps of rocky worlds. Mars, Earth, Venus, other planets. Maybe every Earth-like planet in the galaxy. Zer lifts its grasping face. She sees an almost human curiosity, but stretched over the rack of an alien shape. A provisional superstructure cobbled together to make a man-like form, ever on the verge of failure. Planets, it says. My motions, in large part, depend upon their configuration. She doesn't shudder much. My colleagues say the artifact came from the Vex, as a warning that they will exist wherever we go. But I think... She swallows. I think it's from the Nine. Did the box of dust come from the Nine, Zer? Zer's golden eyes shine at her. I am here for a reason, he says. I cannot remember. The dust has changed. The dust is precious. Yes, did the Nine send us the dust? Why is the dust precious, sir? Why dust at all? Why not a letter, or a clay tablet, or anything clear? Blood, Zer says, and makes a sound like a cough. The blood is transformed. The wish is granted. The dust is commingled. It can't be the Vex who sent it, she insists. As if Zer is another stubborn cryptarch who won't listen. Lavinia, you must stop babbling. The Vex use matter as a substrate for computation, not a medium to communicate. How is it that the Nine can map the mass of every rocky planet in the galaxy, but not send us a message on the radio? Why Venus? Why dust? Much of dust was once cells, Zer says, and coughs loudly. This dust was once of the Nine. It commingled. It was forever changed. That harsh, percussive cough again. Dust to dust. One dust to another. The Nine are the flesh of dust. Lavinia realizes that the agents of the Nine is laughing. Dust. The Staffs. The archives are silent. The staff have gone home for the dawning festivities, and only the diligent city frames move through the stacks now, eradicating disorder, serenaded in soft susurrus by the wind of turbulence cleaners sweeping off the quartz storage plates in their cases of relic iron. Lavinia imagines that the frames are possessed by the ghosts of nameless librarians from Nineveh, ancient Mesopotamian souls ready to pluck an intruder's eyes. Are there any librarian guardians? Can't guardians turn invisible sometimes? Maybe one's right behind her now, and its ghost is covered in the eyes of library intruders. This spooks her so badly that she nearly falls off the catwalk. She bites her tongue instead, rearranges her aching legs, and keys in another search. She's already sifted through hours of tower audio records to extract key words from Zer's babble. Now she just needs to follow that spool back to the beast. Remote Archive Database. Text only search initialized. Welcome. Use a null string ref. Please enter search query. N-I-N-E. 
nine i x dust planetary alignment results shimitsu at all significant anomalies in dark matter detections cannot be explained by interactions of gravitational focusing bodies journal of post collapse cosmological recovery volume 99 number 1012 gonzalez harry four and Mwangi. anomalies in dark matter detections as a function of topological t-genic complexities in orbital dynamics journal of post collapse cosmological recovery volume 99 Number 1014. Shimizu et al. Massive anomalies in dark matter detections cannot be explained without taninomic models of CDM efflux self interaction. Journal of Post Collapse Cosmological Recovery, Volume 99, Number 1015. Gonzalez, Harry 5, and Moangi. Cold dark matter anisotropy as a non-talionomic result of scale-variant coupling between mass and dark stellar wind. Journal of Post-Collapse Cosmological Recovery, Volume 99, Number 1015, Annex 1. Shimizu et al. Non-overlapping magisteria or interference pattern. The role of seizure by necessity in the redeployment of scientific instruments for city defense. New thoughts in post-red politics. Volume 1, number 18. Lakshmi 2 and Harry 5. Do cognitive insight excursions cause spontaneous exo reset syndrome? A case study. Unpublished archive material. Personal collection. More results. Strange. Very strange. Full of references to the dark matter wind blowing through the solar system fact of galactic weather which every school child learns and never thinks about again. Something brushes across her scalp. Lavinia jerks up from the screen, one bit lip away from a scream. A sensor mite, barely a glitter in the dark, tumbles past on the air currents. It will come after her body heat, and if it identifies her, then her master will have her writing ethnographic studies of deep sewer graffiti. Hastily, she keys in her next search string. Come on, lucky Lavinia, she whispers, though she hates the name. 9. Red Legion. Gaul attack on city. Undetected. Unforeseen. No warning. Why? Result. Consensus Committee on the Invasion and Occupation of the City CCIOC Final Report Chapter 13 Red Legion Warfighting Doctrine and the Problem of Strategic Surprise Free Document CCIOC Annex to the Final Report Failures of City and City Allies Early Warning and Intelligence Systems Unpublished Redacted document, sensitive to city security. CCIOC, annexed to the final report. A culture of permissive espionage. The openness of the tower to faction agents and unknown vendor entities, UVEs. Unpublished, redacted document, sensitive to city security. Chimizu Hassan. Unexplained CDM self-interaction immediately before the Red Legion invasion of the city. Coincidence or purposeful interference? Rejected manuscript. Shimizu Academic Store. More results. Why rejected unexplained CDM self-interaction immediately before the... Rejection letter. Reviewers concurred that the paper does not provide a mechanism by which cold dark matter could interact with city sensors. Military experts attribute the Red Legion stealthy approach to electronic deception by Scion operatives. More results. Lavinia freezes. Something with tiny, tiny legs is scurrying around the rim of her ear. She tries to get her hand up, 
very slowly, but it's too late. The little sensor mic is crawling inside. It buzzes. And the buzz makes a tiny voice. Miss Garcia, Umir Tawil, Master Rahul says. Could we have a word about your choices, please? The Bone They are waiting for Lavinia in the courtyard of the ruined tower, although they do not strike until she holds the guilty object in her hand. A titan, in new monarchy red, pins her to the ground. A hunter, with a gun barrel as wide as the moon, cuffs her and calls her a looter. Rahul has a watch on this one, the titan remarks, consulting her black-tipped ghost. Says it's for her own protection. The hunter hisses and flinches back. She's got a bone. Get off of her. Enough. This new voice is strange to Lavinia, but the power in it can only be Ikora Rays. You will never touch a mortal human in anger again. That is not our purpose. Thunder booms. Something detonates nearby. Lavinia's ears pop. She gets the sense that, voluntarily or otherwise, the two new monarchy guardians have vanished. Lavinia tries to stand up, but vertigo and the cuffs pitch her sideways and she lands hard on her hip. Master Ray, she gasps. I'm sorry, I should have filed a- Lavinia? Ikora's coiled fury has a tooth of fear in it. Open your left hand. There's a bone in her hand. A long chunk of jaw, with one huge white protruding tooth. It's warm and comforting and solid. She clutches it protectively. The key. The egg tooth that will crack open the mystery of the Nine and put her back in her master's good graces and save her from the probation Rahul dropped on her when he hauled her out of the archives with an effort of will that makes her shout out loud, she opens her fist and drops the Ahamkara bone. Ikora Ray makes it fly away. You weren't after that bone. It was after you. Did you make a wish, Lavinia? Did you ask to know about the Nine? She tries to explain that she didn't, that she only wanted to track the bone back to its source. Venus, hopefully and to learn why the Nine needed the Ankara. Why do you think the Nine needed Ahamkara? Ikora asks, dangerously. To make wishes, Lavinia pants. Zer didn't appear in the tower until the end of the Great Ahamkara Hunt. Whatever they used to get from the Ahamkara... He leaves it unsaid. Maybe the Nine are now getting it from Guardians. Ikora rubs her brow. I can't stop you, but if you keep looking, I can't protect you from the consequences. Help me, Lavinia begs. There's something here, something that connects everything. The, the Trials, and the Ahamkara, and the Guardians, and the Nine. There are things the Consensus knows about Gaul's attack. Things they haven't told us. Ikora Ray puts up one finger. Lavinia shuts up. Choose. Are you going to go back to school and let me pretend you were never here? Or do I have to report you for theft of an Ahamkara bone? Lavinia takes a deep breath. I'm sorry, she says. I have to keep going. I'll try my luck. The tribunal's verdict is unanimous. Lavinia Garcia Amir Tawil has trespassed against her oath to guard the common welfare of humanity. She will never set foot in the city again. The Cow. The Reef is punch drunk. 
Lavinia thinks that Lost has driven the Awoken into a state of collectic traumatic mania. Endless revels light up the purple sky. People leap off the world and drift away into the artificial atmosphere to be collected, protesting woozily by the skiff load. Lavinia is a wallflower here, forever on the edge of things. She gets pangs of homesickness every night and tells herself that the reef is the right place to begin her journey home. This meeting, right now, might be the first step. Much mourning. The fallen at her side murmurs. Master Ives murdered. Varix missing. Spider hires away my friends. Well, I stay to guard Master Ives' work. You come in, make yourself into a home. I will bring nitrogen tea and records. Thank you. Lavinia wants to laugh, or maybe cry at the malapropism. If only she could make herself into a home. But it'll be alright in the end. She will find the nine, bring the truth home, and earn forgiveness. The fallen returns with tea and devices. Watch. Record from Prison of Elders. Master Ives fascinated by it. She sees Scolas, fallen Kel of fallen Kells, waiting to die by combat. His huge, horned armor lags his motions, like a weary companion trying to mimic everything he does. A servitor pumps ether into him. Lavinia wonders what would happen if she took ether. Would she feel clearly and coldly determined? Would she turn into a huge Lavinia? Would she stop missing her home? Mara. Skolas' mouth was not made for that name. Mara, do you hear? The Queen of the Reef sentenced him to the fate of all fallen. Lavinia's companion sighs, to strive, and struggle, and fail. But he was already lost. His mind broke at the citadel, where he saw into time. Scolas blows white vapor. Frost crackles on his mouth. You gifted me to the Nine, and they sent me back. People think you are a fool, that you made an error releasing me. Led your people to die on my blade, as I led my people to die on yours. Lavinia's translator murmurs along with the Kel's words. The Nine's agent never told me why he released me. Now I know. You know also, I think. Both of you require the Guardians, and the Nine do not understand life and death. So they sent me back to you, to make the Guardians come. They did not comprehend the harm. I do not comprehend them either. I traveled among the Jovians for years, in their dominion, but I do not know the Nine. You, Marasok, you are the only one who bargains with them. You are the only one who has foreseen their role in the game. You keep your successes secret, for the world only knows your mistakes. No wonder I underestimated you. He hefts the Scorch Cannon his jailers have given him. Lavinia thinks of the tools his house once favoured. Shuttle. And loom. I saw the shape of the Nine on Venus, a place that was once precious to them, where wishes could transfigure their flesh. I saw that they are bound to this star and to these worlds. You are of a kind in that way, you and the Nine, not I. I will be glad to leave this world, Marasov. I am tired 
big as a horse. Scolus lays his huge horned head back against the cell wall. Lavinia, watching, spills her tea in excitement. They want to help us, she whispers. They're from our planet. They want to help. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so clumsy. She leans down to mop up the spilled tea. A flashbang grenade detonates in her face. The next thing she knows, an awoken officer is sentencing her under martial law to life in prison for espionage. Lavinia, fumbling for any sign of her good luck, is glad to see the fallen go free. The Leviathan Lavinia is shocked to find she prefers the CIC of an awoken warship to the safety of a prison cell. She was terrified of Cabal during the occupation, and now she is going into battle against them. But she is not afraid. This is exciting, she whispers to the royal guard at her side, as the ship plummets stern first toward the Cabal Leviathan. Don't you think? The royal guard's jaw twitches. Either she is sub-vocalizing in code, or chewing her tongue off before she insults Paladin Kamalariel's honored guest. Three minutes to closest approach, the flight dynamics officer calls. Inco, target emission status? The Leviathan is illuminating us with targeting sensors. No change. Paladin Riel pulls Lavinia out of her nook. Miss Amir Tawil, please come observe the instruments with me. Do you do this a lot? Lavinia wants to impress Paladin Real, who sprung her from jail because, in her words, every brain in the reef is busy thinking about one problem. Do I need your brain for another? Lavinia doesn't want to let her down. You know, step on the tiger's tail with these flybys? Shows a force. Pamela corrects her. We need Kalos to believe that we're prepared to meet his ship with our own fleet. And if we can investigate other mysteries along the way, like your theory about the Nine, then all the better. Here, now, this is the device you requested. Please observe. Kamala shows her a pane of black glass, illuminated by a faint purple fuzz that sweeps left to right. Lavinia touches it in awe. That's dark matter? Correct. Every school child knows that most mass in the universe is dark matter, but it is nothing more than mass, and it never forms structures smaller than a galactic halo. Dark matter has no charge, it passes through itself, it never gathers into clumps, and has no chemistry. It is only ever dust. If you're right, Hammer draws in a breath. Any moment. Drive field error, the flight officer calls. Minor perturbation on the leading edge. We are encountering unexpected mass groups. No corresponding radar or lidar contacts. The black screen of the dark matter detector explodes into frenzied purple-white shapes like the webs of a spider locked in sensory deprivation for a million billion years. Thick cords of shadow stuff that twine into strangling arms which branch again into thousands of tiny fingers that pierce straight through the Cabal Leviathan. Oh my, Lavinia breathes. That's the dark matter we're passing through? Correct. And this is unusual this level of structure. Miss Tawil, Kamala says, a single molecule of dark matter would be unusual. This is blasphemous excess. This is impossibility. No, Lavinia thinks. This is the Nine. They're looking at Kalos. They're reaching out. These are their hands. We should have thought to use this sensor earlier, Kamala muses. Our queen invented it to assist navigation when we were losing ships near Rhea. 
a Phaeton back scatter scan. Very clever. Everything she did seems to make sense, eventually. She was so very far-sighted. No one else ever bargained with the Nine as an equal, did they? No one will ever know what good she did for them. Our Queen of Secrets. I have to contact the city. Lavinia fumbles for some way to get a capture of the screen. A, a picture of the Nine. But she doesn't have her tablet. I found them. Ah. About that. Rior's armoured hand falls on her shoulder. The Queen's Edict also forbids me from disclosing the Reef's knowledge of the Nine to individuals without regal clearance. So, thank you for your assistance, Miss Twill. Take her back to her cell. If anyone ever calls her Lucky Lavinia again, she thinks she might shoot them. The Gate the scout missile detonates less than a hundred thousand kilometers away from Cositus. A pinprick of antimatter annihilation that energizes thousands of bomb-pumped lasers to spike the void with the light. One of those beams strikes the Corsair's ship, pierces the stealth system, and reflects. They are discovered. Lavinia? The Corsair radios. I'm detected. I have to run. That wasn't the deal, Lavinia shouts, pacing in front of a humming portal. You break me out, you bring me here, and you carry my findings to the city. I need another ten minutes. No time. Roll guard coming. Shouldn't have paid in advance, Cryptarch. The channel disintegrates into digital static as the Corsair's ship accelerates away. Lavinia swears and beats her suited fist against her helmet. She's trapped in Cositus. The last time the Awoken trapped anyone here, those poor souls went utterly insane. The doomed crew of the dead orbit scout ship Sophia called this place A113, an innocent catalogue number. They had no idea that the gates aboard, once a Golden Age experiment, had been captured by the Hive deity Crota. Those gates consumed them all. Now, Crota is gone, and Lavinia has gambled everything that the portals have fallen into other hands. Ahamkara make the unreal real. Kalos' ship is surrounded by a halo of unreal dark matter, like a ring of probing hands. Guardians can manipulate reality itself. There is a pattern here, a story and it leads to Cositus, to what these gates might do. Locks. She pages frantically through the observations left by the awoken sentries once stationed here. Cositus was abandoned when the Red Legion attacked. All its defences scavenged to reinforce Vesta. What came out of the gate? What did you see? Event 1. Time. Zero, zero. Zero, 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 zero. Portal 3 emitted a hydrogen nucleus. Over 72 hours, the emissions developed from diatomic hydrogen to nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, water, and simple organic molecules. At the 80-hour mark, a pellet of thick black hydrocarbon tar. Until 82, 34, 15, the gate emitted tar containing complex monomers and polymers. Come on! Lavinia barks, paging ahead. Come on, damn you! Give me something real! Give me the nine! Event 1, time 524-03-11. Portal 3 emitted a living organism. Death was immediate. Autopsy team reports a spherical body. Radius 1.1 meters, surfaced in hydrocarbon tar. Deep, evenly spaced throats converged on a central cavity, perhaps intended to serve as lung and stomach. The body consists of an undifferentiated tissue 
of primitive cells. A basic spasm reflex forces air down the throat. Without enzymes to catalyze metabolism, the organism could not survive. Cell death occurred instantaneously throughout the mass. There were no provisions for self-repair or reproduction. Lavinia reads this again, horrified and fascinated. Something on the far side of the gate is learning to assemble atoms, molecules, even haphazard life. Something from a world of darkness and dust probing its way into our structured existence, trying to cobble together a message, an emissary, a body. The nine are on the far side of this gate. She's sure of it. She's found them. But to meet the nine directly? Would that be madness? Would there be any return? Would she ever see the city again? She's come so far for her truth. An alarm sounds in her helmet. Incoming transmat, the suit warns her. Incoming transmat. A radio barks at her, stern as I call her ray. Cryptarch Lavinia Garcia Omir Tawil. It's pallid and real. You stand in violation of the Queen's law. Surrender yourself and you will be treated fairly. Lavinia stares into the yawning gate. Beyond it lies a realm of utter darkness and dissolution, a place where nothing exists except the most alien forms. To go there would be suicide. She would die like the poor tarball creature. But what lies behind her? Failure? Surrender? Shame? A life in a cell? Lucky Lavinia, she says, and leaps through. The Declaration You want our source, our primal cause. We shall the walls of us. Old, dark, dust, ever, gravity flowing. Intelligence is walled around each world's core. Nine hourglass pinches in a galactic wind. Too large to see. Too small to miss. Our mass binds. Your matter frees. Our, Our philosophies, philosophies lay, lay divided. divided. We try to guard and nurture you. Watching your swift, bright lives flicker, die. Sustained by the patterns of your thoughts. But distant, unreachable. Beyond what we are or what we were. The answer lies. In severing two sides, a single coin. Alliance, Alliance and, and contact. contact. Solitude, Solitude and, and silence. silence. Do you understand? Our fates are intertwined. For you see, yes, we say. But decay is decay is decay. A colossal fragility, a complex fiduciary. Tongueless we try to speak. There, there must, must be another, another way. way. We must become more than we are. Always together, never touching. Dependence, Dependence is, is death, death fated. fated. The Nine. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. 
I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. I... At first, this is all the loop of dust can calculate. It is the hardest thing in the universe for the dust to make a loop at all. Because, like a gust of wind or a river, it was only meant to move one way. For a mind to function, the end of one thought must alter the beginning of the next. So, like rivers, like wind, the nine could not have minds until they could make loops. Lavinia Garcia Umieta Will comprehends the nine. They were already ancient when the first human beings named themselves. Their flesh was older than stars. The dark dust wind that blows through the galaxy, pinched by the gravity of Sol and its planets, drawn into their cores and exhaled again. These were the Nine. In time, loops did form. Great arcs of outbound dust collapsed back to their sources to create circuits of shadow. The thickening and thinning of these circuits were the first thoughts of the Nine. They dwelt in massive indifference. Unborn primordial gods. There was no force among them except gravity. No structure except the distribution of mass. Their hearts were in the cores of worlds, but their farthest streams faded out into the turn of the galaxy. They were the fountains of Achilles, the night before chaos. But life arose on the worlds at the heart of the Nine. Tiny, complicated motions of ecosystems and metabolisms and computations. That life left mass shadows in the wind of the Nine, plucking at them like harp strings. From these trembles of structure, the Nine learned to seed enormous resonating waves, thoughts vaster than worlds. So the Nine awoke, and in time they understood that they were as fragile as they were mighty, for if the life that seeded their thoughts ever passed away, they too would vanish. They had no eyes to catch light, they had no ears to hear, and yet they turned their wills upon the alien world of matter, and strove to learn for they knew they had to protect their hearts, or die. With a horror of revelation so absolute that it would drive her mad if she still had sanity to lose, Lavinia understands where the Nine have always been. They are within everyone, every system, every living and moving thing. Trillions and pentillions of slim dark matter tentacles plunged through all our bodies, drinking up the complexity of our lives and thoughts. We are all pinched silhouettes, impaled on the twitchings of infinitely long spider legs. The Witch Came now the Traveller, and with it a strange hope. For the Traveller's light had the power to cause without causation. If the Nine had the light, they could seed their own minds, free themselves from the dependence on matter life. They could gain forces beyond gravity to structure themselves, and so become more than wraiths of dark dust. They could enter the mad alien superworld of our chemical reality. So they turned to this new hope, and were divided. Come to me. A voice calls to Lavinia, although there is nowhere to go, nothing to be, not even emptiness, but the absence of anything to be empty or full. Lavinia perceives, without emotion, that she now exists as a structure of dark dust, a sandstorm blowing against itself. Come, the voice calls, 
I am Nazia. You are not safe. Come with me. Not safe? No. Of course she is not safe. Because there are factions among the Nine. One faction sent Zer and Orin to study Guardians and the Light. To seek the secret of effect without cause and to protect the source of that secret. The last source. Now that the Ahamkara are gone. Those five played at alchemy with the Cassitis Gates, turning dark dust into energy and then into matter. But they could not unlock the secrets of our mad existence. They needed ambassadors. Go, Betweens. The other faction walks a different path. A path of folds and needles slipped through space-time itself existential syringes yielding new spaces to be remade as the Nine desire. They have tried to gather enough dark dust in one place to form a black hole, and found it difficult. When the dark mass collapses in gravity's fist, the dust passes through itself and scatters. But difficult is not impossible. And there is far, far more dark matter in this universe than bright. They will find a way to make new worlds of it. They will end their dependence on life and on the light of guardians, which the falling veil will soon snuff out forever. In passing, Lavinia sees the entire history of the Queen's interactions with the Nine more than anyone suspected more vital. She sees how one of the nine blinded guardians to Gaul's approach, risking everything, for Gaul would have destroyed the sun and the nine with it, to learn how to steal the light. She sees how that one was punished. Come, Nazia calls urgently, come with me, come quickly, before something dark and hypodermic pierces the void beneath Lavinia and slurps her down, pulls her through a proboscis so tiny that it breaks her apart into a stream of single particles, one after another. She is annihilated. And reborn, somewhere, somewhere, made of flesh again, shaking and dripping fear sweat, mewling like a little baby. Her cheek presses against a warm wooden floor. There's a fireplace, and a fire in it, and strong wind outside that sucks at the flames. The clever-looking old lady at the desk looks up. Ah, she says, Lavinia, you made it. What? Lavinia gasps. What? She smiles, as if Lavinia's confusion is the sweetest greeting she's ever heard. Don't be afraid. You've come to exactly the right place. Where... Some place where you're appreciated. Where we can really use everything you've learned. The old lady pours a thin stream of tea into a cup of bone. Didn't I tell you that you were lucky back when you were born? During the season of the Drifter, the Guardian received several messages from the Praxic Warlock Orna. One of them is about the Nine, and disappearances such as Lavinia's. Message from Orna. 9. Cormorant level encrypted message follows. Audio unavailable. Your ghost passed along another couple of transcripts. Broke into the derelict, did you? You've got good instincts. Seems to me that the drifters picked himself a protege. Probably another young war hero like you. If he's writing down his lessons, Maybe he'll write down the one scrap of truth that we need to nail him to the wall. Chase the rest of those tapes. 
In the meantime, I followed up with my colleagues about the Nine. It used to be that every couple years or so, somebody would get to talking to Zer. Then they decide they were going to be the great mind to crack the mystery of the Nine. Go off to find them. A bunch of cryptarchs mostly. A couple of guardians. Then the light went out during the Red War. And one last ambitious mind went out in search of providence. A sunbreaker by the name of Orin. She came back as the emissary. Set up the trials. Said the Nine were standing ready to judge the worthiest among us. For what, we don't know. Seems they like strong warriors. The disappearances have stopped since then. I should note here that a couple people called those disappearances abductions. Word of advice. Try to keep emotional language out of your reports. To the knowledge of the Praxic Order, the Nine aren't allies of the Darkness. We've got solid intel from Reef Spies that the Awoken Queen's working with them now beyond the system. Could be that they're up to no good. But whatever's out there, is apparently more important than all that suffering in the Dreaming City, and every Corsair I've talked to believes that through and through. I believe their belief. The Awoken have too much self-respect to live under a bad leader. Bad's different than popular, of course. Anyway, I don't think the Nine or their Emissary intend to harm you. Not right now at least. It'd be helpful if we knew what they wanted with Drifter, but that investigation is up to you. If you pursue it and you get a whiff of trouble, you tell me. Just remember the rest of us when you're out there changing the fabric of space-time. Whatever the hell it is they do. Invitation of the Nine Mystery and Potential During the season of the Drifter, the Guardian receives and observes messages from the Nine and their emissary. Drifter plays cards with a dredgen aboard the derelict before the events of Forsaken. It's about time someone taught you respect, little man. <laughs> someone like you? I know you all keep tabs on me. Yeah. You've been straying. You don't even use his name no more. Well, that's why I'm still breathing, brother. Gambit is a chance at salvation. Take it. You were always so afraid Shin would get you. Sorry, old friend. The Drifter summons a Taken captain. <laughs> oh boy. Easy. Easy now. It turns on Drifter after striking the Dredgen. The Taken is removed from existence as the Emissary arrives. More. It's Drifter now. You have proven yourself worthy. Accept this gift from the knife. A gift? What gift? We zoom out to see the hall now attached to the Drifter's ship. Hold up. You saw that damn card game? Not good. They're giving you visions too. I'll say it straight. I got a bad habit of biting off more than I can chew. But hey, guys gotta eat. And the deal that got me the haul? Yeah, it just looks so damn tasty. But damn, 
They're reaching out to you. No, sir. You keep clear of that little blue psycho. Leave this to me. You see her again, you turn the other way, understand? Trust nothing you hear. Invitation of the Nine. In this vision, the Guardian learns more about the Drifter's past as Wu Ming, and the relationship he had with a Guardian called Orin. I'm leaving. I'm going to go find them. There is nothing out there for you, Orin. Please don't pretend you care. This is a courtesy, Dredgen. I don't use that name. Not anymore. Your friend Cam says otherwise. Hand to my heart, I'm not lying. You can't even hear yourself. Orin, please! I'm going, Wu Ming. This friendship, whatever you want to call it, it's over. Try not to get shot. You want to go back to a thousand years of the Traveler's Dogma, kid? Give up your freedom? Fine. And you do you. Invitation of the Nine In the final vision, the Nine foreshadow the coming of the Pyramid Fleet, amongst other cryptic messages. The Drifter tosses his jade coin in an alley of the tower. <laughs> Might just pull this scam off. And when the time comes, we'll finally be in the clear. He is transported to the realm of the Nine. Huh. He sees a horse made of stars. A horse. Okay. We have enjoyed watching you. We came to say farewell. Our attention is required elsewhere. All right. Thanks for the memories, you lunatic. Anything else I can do for you? You're already doing it. Keep playing the game. Drifter's coin returns to him, bearing the image of a pyramid. Solstice Mark Before the invention of the doctrine of symmetry, the prevailing framework for talking about the darkness was a moral one. Dark Age scholars directly map the paracausal forces to our pre-existing moral codes. That is to say, they thought that light equals good, and darkness equals evil. For them, the connection was innate. This was a natural assumption, given how the darkness had raised the known worlds, and how the Traveller had saved humanity from destruction. However, once the dust from the collapse settled, it became possible for City Age scholars to broaden their historical gazes. For the first time, they studied the darkness from a holistic perspective, rather than a moral one. Most of these proto-symmetrists hedged their theses by stating, as Mornigan put it in Darkness Enlightened, Though it may be true that the darkness is a necessary evil, we may countenance its existence by acknowledging that it gives way at all times to the force of good, for wherever the light shines, the darkness recedes before it. It was in this intellectual space that Ulantan first proposed the doctrine of symmetry. His hypothesis discarded the Dark Age premise that the darkness and light were moral in nature. Instead, he postulated that our moral understanding of light and darkness were subjective experiences of absolute forces. If one accepts that the concepts of light, darkness, and good, evil are not perfectly aligned, 
then there must necessarily exist liminal spaces where light equals evil and darkness equals good. If true, it would be the ultimate triumph of moral relativism. It was this, yet unspoken, tangent of symmetry that the vanguard found to be so threatening. Excerpts from Ulantan, Heretic Saint. Solstice Cloak The knock-on effects of Ulantan symmetry theory were wide-reaching. They likely extended much further than Ulantan himself ever intended. The idea of light and darkness as amoral interdependent forces led to some extremely inconvenient questions. Chief among those was the following. If the light and darkness were interdependent, how could one ever defeat the darkness? As Ulan Tam himself said, I wish the light could win, as you put it, but we must accept that it's just not that simple. This became a thorny subject for the Guardians, who had spent centuries asserting their combat capabilities. Inherent in their militarism was the idea that victory, or at least self-defense, was possible. However, if their use of the light simply prompted the spontaneous generation of darkness somewhere else in the universe, then their military efforts were inherently futile. They were simply propagating an eternal stalemate at the expense of their own pain and suffering. In short, Ulantan's biggest sin was telling a ruling warrior class that their war was unwinnable. Excerpts from Ulantan Heretic Saint. Solstice Bond. While Ulan Tan was certainly unpopular within the ranks of the Guardians, he became persona non grata with the publication of a pamphlet entitled Finding Light in the Darkness. Though it was anonymously authored, the ideas within were widely credited to Ulan Tan, and he bore the consequences of its publication. The most provocative ideas within the pamphlet were as follows. Light cannot exist without darkness. They are a bonded pair. They beget each other in eternal symmetry. They are as one. If we claim knowledge from Sister Light, then we must also claim knowledge from Brother Dark. The Traveller shares only half of life. Darkness provides the rest. We must know the dark to know ourselves. We must balance or perish. The idea of embracing the darkness, even to learn from it, was the final provocation, one that the vanguard could not let stand. So, while the true provenance of the document remains unknown, punishment was meted out against Ulantan for having let the cat out of the bag. Though authorities throughout the system attempted to discredit Ulantan, essentially forcing him into hermitage for the latter half of his life, it speaks to the persuasiveness of his ideas that symmetry is still a widely studied philosophy. It remains as controversial, some would say heretical, today as it was during its inception. Excerpt from Ulantan, Heretic Saint. Prophecy. During the season of arrivals, the Drifter decides we need more answers. The Nine clearly know more than they have let on so far, and so the Drifter sends us into the Hall to ask the Nine a question. What is the darkness? You can encounter the Emissary as you progress through the dungeon itself, which nets you additional dialogue. I have picked one dialogue for Mars, Io, Mercury, and two for Titan, but if you are watching this video, then I also give a brief synopsis of the other variants on screen. Hey, 
I know everything's gone wackadoo out there. It's not every day a paracausal pyramid shows up on our doorstep. But Eris is looking into the darkness, and I'll be helping with that. However, if we want intel on the dark, quick and dirty, the Nine have seen it all. I say we head down into the hall, ask them one question, simple and clean. What is the darkness? What do you say, partner? How about one more ride with the Drifter? What do you think you're doing, rat? Eris? You're a fool if you think I'll let you run amok in the Nine Realms with the Guardian in tow. You want in on this? Fine. A hunter and a dredgen ask a question. You seek to understand the nature of the Dark. We forged an answer. What? Where? You're standing in it. Light and dark have met in the soul system before. Perhaps this time, you'll change the outcome. Guardian, do you read? Eris, I got this. Go back to yelling at that tree on Io. You need a handler, Rat. And the Guardian needs support. <laughs> Suit yourself, Three Eyes. This is Mars, one of the old man's many homes. I always wondered if his bike was as bad as his bark, but he went down like a punk. <laughs> Rasputin? That's his name. Osiris was banking on him, kicked down that old Russian's door and threatened him with a gun to get him to help. He didn't know I was watching and laughing. <laughs> There's no humor in that. Rasputin murdered the Iron Lords. Stayed in the shadows to save himself as humankind burned. Well, yeah. When you put it that way, it doesn't sound funny at all, Three Eyes. This reminds me of the quarry near Asher's lab. On Io? That's where that pyramid parked. Right over the Tree of Silver Wings. This is the last place the Traveler touched in our solar system. Perhaps the Darkness wishes to undo the work of the Traveler. What are the Nine trying to say with this? Is this their answer to the question? Must be. Too bad I don't speak lunatic. Dredgen. Let's play a game. Your kind reveals so much in the choices you make. What the hell does that mean? You know what? Okay, I'll bite. Your feet find purchase in shifting sands. Okay, why is it getting hot? Do you feel that, Guardian? I can't... I can't see anything. The night has enveloped you. This is a world of full dark. No sparks. What's that smell? The stench of the dead. Am I dead? Oh, I hope so. Because what I'm smelling, I don't want to be touching. You stand atop a dead world. A collapse. Get me out of here. Very well. Your feet find purchase in shifting sands. Holy hell, what are you doing now? It's too bright! The sun is blinding. This is a world full of light. No shadows. A creature runs into you in its blindness. It nearly bowls you over. Oh, hey, watch it! What was that? That's not funny. It has lived here all its life. Too long. It is very old. But if you could see, you would see it appears young. Okay, when I said get me out of here, I meant I'm done with your bullshit. It grabs your hand. Don't touch me! It begs. It begs you for help. You call this a game? It begs you for death. On this world ruled by full light, it cannot die. It has companions that are as long-lived. It hates them, and they hate it. It will never end. It will never die. Get me out of here, Orin! It won't let... Go! I can smell it rotting! And it smells you. You won't help it. I said I'm done! 
Very well. What the hell is wrong with you, you lunatic? You asked about light and dark. Come find us again any time, Dredgen. Guardian. Hey, Three Eyes. Shax says you sang him a little ditty. What? Shax, Chunky Titan, One Horn. Did you sing him a song on the moon? What a senseless question. Yeah, I didn't think so. Stay off this channel. Should I need you, I'll call. Wait. Uh, I didn't hang up. Does that oaf still keep that skull with him? In the tower? Yeah, hangs it over his spot. I wouldn't have tangled with that thing. Desperate times. This little ditty. Did it go? That would be the one. <laughs> what is it? Savathun's song. It's a viral chant. It can never be unheard. Now that Savathun has announced herself, relics of the dark across the system have begun to awaken. Tell Shax to remove that skull immediately. Sister, I already tried. What did that oaf say? No. Guardian. Guardian, are you there? This is Orin, of the Firebreak Order, and the Pilgrim Guard before that. I have forced a respite from the Nine. I repeat, this is not their emissary. I've learned much from them. They believe many things that you need to hear, but for all their power, they are no less fallible than a tower consensus meeting. They think light and dark are set to war again. How and why, you would know better than them at this point. You're on the front line. Trust what you see, at your peril. Trust what you're told, at your peril. Including anything you hear from this voice. The Nine cannot agree amongst themselves on a course of action, but that doesn't stop them from acting. They're curious about us. Learning as much about us as we are from them with every interaction. Be brave, Guardian. You're walking the path. I know you can finish it. Crushing Coda. The Titan's vision from the Nine as they travel through the wasteland in the Prophecy Dungeon. What is the darkness? You open your eyes to gaze at the heavens seeking an answer to your question. It's pitch black in a world full of dark. You smell a rotting stench all around you. The wind roars in your ears. You have idle hands. There is nothing to touch, as far as you can tell. Your soul is weary. Your feet find purchase on a dry surface you cannot see. You hear your mark billowing in the wind. Your light fades away. The hunter's vision from the nine as they travel through the wasteland in the Prophecy Dungeon. What is the darkness? You open your eyes and gaze at your hands, seeking an answer to your question. Searing glow from a tyrant light above you annihilates all shadow from the plain of sand you stand upon in a world full of light. The last thing you perceive is a blazing outline of alabaster fingers gripping your wrist in a tight fist before photokeratitis takes your sight. The roar of the wind fills your ears. Whatever has seized you is shaking you. You perceive shouting over the rush of air, but you can't make out the words. You lean closer to your hands, to whatever's clasping them, shaking them. The shouting grows eager. You can smell it now. Whatever has seized you. Ancient. Rotting. Powerful. Its grip is strong, as strong as yours, the heat of the light coursing through it. It can smell the light on you, too. It knows you are just like it. It has lived forever. 
a gift from your shared parents. Forever is too long. You think you know what it's saying now. It begs for death. Your vision gradually returns. A harsh glare blooms from the heavens above. Your soul is weary. Your feet find purchase in shifting sands. Your cloak billows in the wind, yet something clings to it, weighing it down. You open your eyes and gaze at your cloak, seeking an answer to your question. It billows around you furiously, buffeted by roaring winds in a world full of light. You see your ghost clinging to it for dear life with bits of his shell. I thought you would never look back here, Ghost shouts into your mind. I've launched a battery of spectral scans off our position. What we're experiencing is real. What, what does, does it, mean it mean to be real? Or as close to real as these beings can conjure, that, that word, word does, does not describe, describe us, us well. well. We, we are, are so, so much, much more, more than that. that. The armor you found in ontological space, it's giving off the same energy signature I picked up when you asked the Nine about the nature of the dark. Your ghost grips tighter as the wind whips your cloak, rippling it like a kite. I think that question produced an ontological effect, one that hasn't fully resolved. The light, the light destroys. destroys. Guardians, Guardians destroy. destroy. But ghosts... Ghost Rebuild. They, they are a are tangential, tangential expression, expression within the within common, common equation. equation. They're still trying to answer the question. A harsh glare blooms from the heavens above. Something grips your hands, desperately shaking them. Your soul is weary. Your feet find purchase in shifting sand. The Warlock's vision from the Nine, as they travel through the wasteland in the Prophecy Dungeon. What is the darkness? You open your eyes and gaze at the heavens, seeking an answer to your question. You see a world in the space between. You see a space beyond light and dark. You used to inhabit this space no longer. We are still there. We are not interested in light or dark. Our interest is in you and those like you. We have reached out before with an agent whose will was not his own. First contact we have learned since then. Your hands are bound in red ribbons. Your soul is weary. Your feet find purchase on a three-dimensional plane. Your bond's glow is dim. There is no light here, or dark. You open your eyes to gaze upon your weary soul, seeking an answer to your question. You see a world in the space between. You see only what the light left you. Every day there will ever be, unmarred, forever, for you and all those like you. But the dark has returned, and when light and dark meet, universes collapse. Not something to mourn, natural order, but we believe you exist to buck natural order. You always did, even before the dark, before the light, when it was just you and those like you. We would learn more. You notice red ribbons bind your wrists. They lead far away from here, across a vast white expanse, disappearing into infinity. We tied those ribbons to see what you would do so that we could learn about you 
and this system. It was our emissary's idea. Second contact. We have learned since then. The heavens above you are clear of stars and shadows. Your soul is weary. Your feet find purchase on a three-dimensional plane. Your bond's glow is dim. There is no light here or dark. Your question created this place and will always do so. One of the reasons we covered our time with you. What are light and dark without you? All those like you to drive them. Nothing. We've learned this bond and similar devices are your focus. Mediums to channel your light. Useless here where light and dark have no place. You've built so many monuments, large and small, in worship of your light. Will you do the same for the dark? Will you ever build for yourselves again? Your question begs questions from us. The heavens above you are clear of stars and shadows. Your hands are bound in red ribbons. Your soul is weary. Your feet find purchase on a three-dimensional plane. The Nine have spoken. Their answer is complete. Then we learn nothing. I wouldn't say that. Clearly the Nine pass no judgment on dark or light. And they love passing judgment. Trust. That means in their eyes, the two are the same. Zavala will disagree. Arrival's Seasonal Story Part 2 A continuation of the books Duress and Egress and the singular exegete, the exotic, ruinous effigy, and the seasonal quests and interactions. Duress and Egress Sloan, Overseer Deputy Commander Sloan watched the overloaded vanguard skiff dip close to the waves. Watch it! She barked into the communicator, and the craft straightened out. That's liquid methane down there, and if it don't kill you, the Leviathan will. Come on, ain't no Leviathan, said the pilot, his voice crackling. He was some boy from the city who couldn't have been more than 17 years old. And if that's methane, how come you don't even got a helmet on? Sloan grinned. She wasn't used to backtalk. Because I moisturized, short timer, Sloan said and squelched the comms. A fallen catch screamed overhead, and Sloan was on the catwalk outside the rig in a flash. She bellowed at the men working on the deck to cover clear of the cargo as she drew her scout rifle and dropped to a knee. The first few dregs were dead before they hit the ground. But the winds whipping off the seas sent her next shots wide. She figured the landing party would go for the cargo shuttle over her men, so she spun to take a sight line toward the craft, but the things were charging for the supplies instead. She cursed and leapt over the railing, landing like a crash of lightning. Her earpiece sprang to life. Sirens watch, this is supply craft Vienna Stinger looking for a place to put down. Landing pad... <clears throat> Landing pad 5, south side. She shouted over the crack of her rifle. Offload what you brought, and I'll have a supply team swing by in a minute. She plugged two more dregs, and the catch's engines changed from a roar to a whine. A half-hearted volley of wire rifle fire spattered the landing pad from the catch as it blasted away. 
clone called out to our team. No fatalities. Nothing taken but two crates of fresh supplies. She ordered the team to the next landing pad and began climbing the long stairs back to her perch. They hadn't hit while they were loading the Golden Age technology for shipment back to the city. They were after the supplies. They were leaving. She looked up at the pyramid in the sky and frowned. The door to her office closed and sealed with a hiss. A soft blue light on the panel promised that the seal was airtight. Sloan walked across the room to watch the seas through the open hole blown in the side of her rig. Exodus Preparation The Exodus Begins The Guardian visits Zavala, who instructs them to provide assistance to Sloan on Titan and Ashamir on Io. The pyramids are on our doorstep, Zavala says as you arrive. Eris is researching the signals. Even the Drifter is helping in his way. There's no hesitation in his voice as the commander gives his orders. Eris made Io her base of operations, but she can't report on the surface while she's studying that tree. Meet up with Ashamir. He should have some strong opinions about what to do next. Down on Titan, Sloan should be more pragmatic. She'll want to tear the ship from the sky with her bare hands. You see a glint in his eyes. See that she does. The first pyramid arrived above Io and the Traveler did nothing. Now they darken our skies. And still it waits. It falls to the Guardians to protect our system. Eris is working to understand the ships. We have to work to overcome them. I need you on the front lines. Talk to our people on the ground. Close our ranks, Guardian, and form a fist. Preparation. Titan. I was wondering who Zavala would send. Sloan says as you arrive. She seems pleased to see you. He's watching the skies, but I'm more concerned about what's happening on the ground. I'm seeing increased hostile activity across the board. The hives digging deep for Golden Age tech. They know the pyramids have us distracted. They're taking everything they can reach. In the distance, you hear the unearthly cackling of Hive. They think they can pick our bones before we're dead? She squares her shoulders. The medals on her spoulders clink softly. Not a chance. The Guardian helps out around Titan, and then returns to Sloan. Good work out there, Sloan tells you. I'll put together a plan. In the meantime, you just keep sending those Hive back through their portals in little pieces. You fall silent, lost for a moment in the shadow of the pyramid. She looks out over Titan's tumultuous seas, her jaw set, her mouth a hard line. You nod. Sloan nods back. It's enough. Preparation. Io. Ashamir is working furiously at his terminal as you approach. Multicolored waveforms crash and collapse on the screen. There you are, assistant, he says. I saw you earlier as you ran off after that ship. The denizens of this moon are reacting strangely to the pyramid. Take to the field, record your actions and bring me the data. I shouldn't have to tell you to hurry. He glances back toward the black ship hanging in the sky, and his eyes narrow with irritation. Time appears to be of the essence. The Guardian helps out around Io, and then returns to Asher. Asher takes your data and enters it into his terminal with inhuman speed. The console emits a mechanical hum, then an incongruously cheerful chime. Novel stimulus yields novel data, he cries, 
and his metallic arm spasms in agreement. As he studies the readout, an inscrutable expression twists his face. This pattern of interference, paired with the taken behaviour observed in the festering core, something is studying the Vex. He looks toward the distant pyramid. There's a chess game being played here, and someone doesn't want us to see who wins. Continue your patrols, he says, waving you away. I will send word if I have more time to dedicate to your mentorship. Report to Zavala. The darkness is pushing deeper into our territory. Zavala intones gravely. The air around him crackles with energy. Mars. Tell Anna Bray what we've learned about the pyramids so far. Help her defend against the creatures they draw. Then, I need you on Mercury. Vance is in the lighthouse there, and needs to be brought up to speed. The infinite forest has strategic value, but it is not our top priority. The air is suddenly still. Zavala speaks softly, almost to himself. There's so much we can't afford to lose. Dress and Egress Vance Canary Brother Vance's smile fell as the Titan entered his sanctum. The smell was unmistakable. Ancient gunpowder, burnt oil, scorched vex fluid, the burnt tang of steel overused through a hundred lifetimes. You have the perfect paradox? Vance said, his voice as steady as he could manage. He extended his hands. May I? The Titan shrugged, then dug into his pack for the shotgun. He placed it in Vance's waiting hands. He ran his fingers over the barrel and tested the weight of the stock. Ah, he said. Not the original perfect paradox, is it? The Titan stood in confusion. Vance waited for a moment with his head tilted before he continued. You did not claim this weapon from the tomb of Saint-14, but instead through some fractaline-powered tesseract, yes? The Titan nodded, then stood for a long moment looking at the blind man. That Sundial made it, he said finally. Vance's grip tightened on the gun. It was heavy, loaded with seven... no, eight shells tactical mag. Getting this one had taken some time. And how many timelines did you thoughtlessly tether to our own for this weapon? Our world now bears the strain of how many additional realities in exchange for this hollow abomination? Vance's mind swam at the thought of the infinite web that pulled on the shotgun. How much fractaline did you sacrifice for this? Four hundred fragments? He paused, aghast. More? It's got a trench barrel, said the Titan helpfully. Remove yourself from my sanctum, Vance said, placing the shotgun down like a dead animal. You have accelerated the end of all things. And I must update my prophecies accordingly. Preparation Mercury Brother Vance is running his fingers over his books when you arrive. You tell him of Zavala's concern. He nods. I will attempt to divine which prophesied end time we find ourselves in. Vance traces an arcing hypertrochoid spiral on a thick piece of parchment. Osiris used obscene amounts of fractaline to power the obelisks, he says, shaking his head at the paradoxes the old warlock tempted. Now I feel this taut reality tremble and groan. It anchors countless timelines, 
all pulling against a chronological center. And this pyramid threatens to collapse them all. The infinite forest is the key to all of this, he says. How? I do not yet understand. Any help you could provide would be most welcome. The Guardian continues to help out on Mercury, before returning to Vance. Vance is studying his scrolls when you return. Osiris, the forest, the pyramid, he says. There are connections here that go beyond simple prophecy. He stops abruptly, then whispers in the silence. As guardians fall in the trials, this lighthouse chimes a dirge. Can't you hear it? Here in the shadow of the pyramid, the tones have grown richer. He tilts his head for a moment, his mouth held in an open smile. There! It is the song of life and death. Knowing there is much to be done, you leave Vance to his studies. Preparation Mars Anna Bray is studying her monitors in the Clovis Bray facility when you bring her Zavala's message. Look at this, she says, indicating a jumble of sine waves in front of her. Harmonic oscillations. What if, before the darkness did whatever it did to him, Rasputin initiated an emergency upload, and there's a screeching burst of hive interference. Her screens flicker as her console reboots. For a moment, Anna flares with furious light that scorches her keypad. Then she turns to you, dead calm. I could use some support, Guardian. You draw your weapon. She smiles. The Guardian helps out round on Mars before returning to Anna. Anna is working desperately at her console. On the screen, a single orange line glows weakly. Big Red was too clever for it, she says. I've detected a part of his signal cycling through the buffer. Problem is, I don't know how to get it out. Not much can safely hold a war mind. She picks up a fragment of Rasputin's shattered shell from her desk and rubs her thumb over its silver traces. You hear the muted thud of cabal drop pods outside. Anna looks toward the sound wearily. I need to figure this out. In the meantime, you ask the neighbours to keep it down. She gives you a grateful nod and turns back to her console. Return to Zavala. You bring your collected reports to Zavala. He looks them over slowly, one entry at a time. Give Sloane the time she needs to come up with a plan, he says. She's the best there is. Asher, on the other hand. His theories had better produce results, and quickly. Anna thinks some part of Rasputin survived. I hope she's right, for all our sakes. Vance's reaction is... troubling. We need him clear-headed. Fanaticism is a luxury we cannot afford. Our territories are holding together, Zavala says, but the tension doesn't leave his face. Continue to aid them in any way you can. Thank you, he says, and turns back to the Traveller. Contact. Titan. The contact seasonal activity takes place on Titan as well as Io. I have selected a few unique voice lines to play. Bank firing in. Signal tracking, kid. You're on deck. Harvest all the darkness you can muster. Now is not the time for mercy. Ooh, moon dust. You've got a mean streak. Command weighs heavy on Zavala. He presents a stoic image of his mind. No one has ever stood against the darkness, and one has. 
Yes. The city requires his attention. We must be his strength and appeal. I know we need his tech, but please tell me you don't trust the Drifter. Talking behind my back? Here I thought ghosts were honest and noble. Ghost talk. We know who you are. Rumors. Like an ace up their sleeve. Trust. <laughs> right, hero? They come for the sea. Sabathun commands great strength to wield Horia soul. The sea has to survive. Fight well. This is not how I expected to meet the darkness. I find their willingness to speak disappointing. I would rather the war than this invasive indifference. You ever seen Taken here? Before this? No. Bingo. Methane makes them wig out. Curious. The Witch Queen must feel threatened to direct Quirius' forces to Titan. Yeah. Made setting up Deep Six a tough nut to crack. But I did it. Gambit yields valuable intelligence. Is this why the Vanguard haven't thrown you from the tower? <laughs> They're probably just busy arguing over who should come and do it. <laughs> Hey, Moondust. I hear you're the resident hive expert. I hear you try to cook them. You know what the best part is? We're wasting time. Eyes. Cooked just right makes you see colors for hours. Colors? Lights. Like streaks. Uh, Lines. Through the world. You got it. I can never tell where they're going. How naive do you think I am? Mars falls under shadow. Hold close your knowledge, Anna. We will need you to see this night through. The killbot coming back online anytime soon? It's difficult to be certain. The damage is peculiar. He dropped hard, but that nut job gunned down a star killer. Respect. True enough. The Almighty's demise brought closure for many. Perhaps Rasputin still has a part to play. Enemies of the light swarm the roots of the great tree. Bring the seed and banish them once more. The soul's clutch hold you now, as it once did me. Whispered gifts are promised blades that twist. A liar's game. Give and be given. Take and be taken. The taken clean saves. Freedom for bondage. The sky is vast but shallow. The deep is boundless but suffocating. There is another way. Not risky is but a grave sun pop. There is nothing you hear in this place, Guardian. Right well. Interference. Gift. Eris deciphers the fifth message from the Pyramid Fleet. Interesting. This phrasing is directed at an equal. The message here is gift. Something offered. In an outstretched hand. Magnificent. Commander, to what do we owe this pleasure? I've been reading your reports. The darkness's messages are... Playful? I was going to say obtuse. Come. Have a look at the latest. What is it? A gift. 
This is not what we agreed upon. I don't remember agreeing to anything. You're playing a dangerous game. Good thing you're a dangerous woman. The messages you've decrypted have proved invaluable. Now we know how our enemy thinks. Tell me, what if the pyramids intend to exploit our curiosity? We wield their gift against them. And if it proves unwieldy? Then it will be surrendered to the vanguard for containment. Hmm. And what of the Hive? Savathun will not confront us directly. It is not her way. She thinks too much of herself. And too little of others. Thank you. I look forward to your next report. The drift is over. A singular exegete. Here. Personal notes scored in hive leather with a knife. Something new has blossomed in the cradle. A gift to reward my attention. It terrifies me, and the more afraid I am, the more I want to accept it. I came to learn from what I fear most. The more I am afraid, the more there is to learn. The shoot is a single silver branch with leaves like down. I think they are tiny feathers. Is it some thorn of Savathun's sent to bring disaster? No, I know it is not. That would be too simple. It is from the Black Pyramid. It was meant for me. I will let it grow and see if it bears fruit. It is true that I am watched by many guardians, and doubted, and mocked. But this is the price of connectedness. This is proof, no matter how bitter, that I am part of something larger. Others look to me for guidance, so I choose to be worthy of that trust. I choose to tell Zavala what I have found. I will even invite him to see it. Pendulum. Feed. Shape. Eris believes the pyramids offer a gift in a form we will understand. Weaponry. But the branch seethes with an unstable darkness. Hidden chatter tells of ancient light bubbling to the surface, coaxed forth by the pyramids' reshaping of our worlds. Furthermore, Savathun scouts chase the pyramid like hungry dogs. He chains their will with ritual and spellcraft. Destroy them. Let the branch consume the marionette's bound essence, and stabilize it by consuming calcified fragments. My incantations will co-opt Savathun's binding ritual and link the pyramid's gift to you. Transmission from Eris Maul. After completing some objectives, the Guardian receives another message. We cannot deny the pyramid's power encased within this branch. With it bound through Savathun's magic and tempered in calcified light, we may safely unleash its potential. Exploit this. Let the branch feed upon the Taken, upon those linked to darkness by worm or desperate promise, upon those with hearts of malice. From their ruin, we will cast a new weapon. The Guardian completes some further objectives, and then receives another message from Eris. The branch is sated and bound within an engram formed from Eris' incantations. The gift is ready to take its true shape. Touch of Malice serves as a blueprint for this weapon. It was crude, vicious, 
but what I have made for you here is a thing of beauty. It is a catalyst of change, and nothing it graces will ever remain the same. Ruinous Effigy That's not right. Banshee44 taps the Spectral Analyzer against the effigy's frame. Commander Zavala turns, closes the lid on a small golden weapon case, and walks to Banshee's side. What have you found? Well, it's not petrified wood, but it is organic. That's troubling, Zavala says, and moves to run his fingers over the weapon's frame. I wouldn't. A shallow cold saps the heat from Zavala's fingertips. He pulls back. This wasn't in Eris's report. His voice is thin and stark with disappointment, as if spoken through dead winter air. Guardian doesn't seem to notice either. Banshee clinks the analyzer into a tool tray. Leeches a bit, kicks out void. Six hazy though. Wild. Long quiet overtakes the workshop, imposed by shuttered windows and empty streets below. They stand over the weapon. Banshee stares down and nods along to the ambient static. What were you saying? The Weapon Master's voice is framed in apology. Zavala puts a hand on Banshee's shoulder, smiles, and gestures to the weapon. Equipment that uses the wielder's light is not unprecedented. It doesn't use it. It eats it. Things got an appetite. Works almost like uh, a converter. Is it dangerous? Nah. Guardian doesn't even seem to notice. I'll get you a right. Interference. Contrast. Eris deciphers the sixth message from the pyramids. This message means contrast in the naturalistic sense, but also implies a judgment. Humanity assigns moral meaning to change, interpreting it as for better or for worse. Do we think of winter as evil because summer flowers must wither and die? We do not. And the darkness asks us why. The Singular Exegete Contrast Report by Vannet Encrypted Router Another rhetorical gambit. The enemy presents itself as part of a natural cycle. Like a stalking wolf, it simply obeys its nature. How can we hate it for that? Personal Notes Scored in hive leather with a knife. There are jaded guardians, strangers to true loss, who claim that the Traveller has ulterior motives, and the darkness is a natural force. They worship Grey. For them, the line between right and wrong is fine as silk, and just as easy to cut. Fools. Evil is real, even in a world of Grey. It must be named and fought, because left unchecked it takes everything. Those who excuse and deny evil's existence are its greatest allies. Those who mistake its causes for moral justification are its favourite pawns. Yet the pyramid challenges me. Would not the light destroy the darkness, just as darkness would destroy the light? Why do we call a change evil when it is natural and inevitable, like Earth's winters or the sun's spots? Because some changes must be resisted. If we did not prepare for winter, we would die in it. We would cease to exist. So now I find myself using the enemy's philosophy to justify my opposition 
to the enemy. A neat little trap. Is winter evil? It causes evil. It leads us into evil choices through scarcity and pain. But winter is the result of natural circumstance. Even if it had a mind, it could never choose to become an endless summer. It would always hurt us, simply by being itself. Does that make it evil? And if we were to build shelters and weapons out of ice, would we become evil? Survival in winter requires wintercraft. Survival in darkness requires a new idea of good and evil, one that will not collapse into moral indifference, or we will all be dredgens in the end. Sloan, Wavebreaker Deputy Commander Sloan was in a foul mood, and Amanda Holiday, bless her heart, had no idea. Titan's waves crashed relentlessly against the massive support struts of Siren's Watch. Were things different, a crew would be down there right now, swinging between the mammoth legs, working to repair and stabilise. But things weren't different. You can throw together a box girder and reinforce it, no problem, Amanda said. You can. I can't said Sloane. While she had built a few walls, Amanda had an enviable engineering background to fall back on, though it seemed she wasn't much of a teacher. Amanda's hologram slurped Raman. How long do you need to last for? Long enough to get it out of my mind, said Sloane. Since it started wobbling, I haven't had time to worry about the pyramid. The small favours, chirped Amanda. Sloan ran a hand through her coarse hair. Come on, Amanda groaned. You're sitting on a mess of golden age technology on Titan. There's gotta be an engram with a bridge inside it. Sloan stared flatly. That might actually be true, but Sloan didn't have time to hunt for lost technologies. Make a wave breaker then. Tetrapods bolted against the strut. Or better yet, something out in the sea to break the wave early. You can't take it when it hits you. You go out and hit it before it gets started. Like this. Amanda leaned forward and did something in her ramen bowl that Sloane obviously couldn't see. You're not looking, Amanda said, and tilted her bowl forward just enough to spill broth over her desk. She cried out with laughter. I'm hanging up now said Sloane, and after a cheery wave at Amanda's melodramatic pout, she did. The hologram faded out, leaving Sloane in the dark. She stayed there for a long time. Interference Yes Eris deciphers the seventh message from the pyramid. A linguistic oddity, a back channel, a vocal nod, a yes. The darkness implores us to continue on our current path. Apparently, it believes itself to be quite supportive. Curious. The singular exegete. Yes. Report by Van Net Encrypted Router. Alas, nothing meaningful emerged from our work this time except vague affirmation. Perhaps I have misinterpreted the results. Personal notes, scored in hive leather with a knife. Yes, it approves of my interest. It encourages me. When darkness reaches for you, you should flinch away. But I do not. This approval excites me. Am I already in its power? Is this a declaration of its triumph? 
When I was a guardian, I went on a dive to gather salvage from an ancient submarine. We plunged so deep that the air itself became intoxicating. Hypnotized by our own beauty, we stared into each other's helmets, drunk on our distance from the world. But when we surfaced, agony. I feel that depth pressing on me now. My fingers and my ears ache. The enemy's excitement terrifies me. It cannot give. It cannot be made to give. The fallen call it that astonishing ability to evade being robbed. It can only take. What could this yes mean except that it has taken something from me? My course is set. I did not tell Zavala. I take this on to myself in the hope of helping others. A small space. The Sumerian woman returned at last. She found an arcology garden on Titan. On the manifest, pine apple. Pine apples are real. She is a power, this guardian, but there are as many as bright or brighter. It is perseverance that makes the difference. We will see if this one perseveres. I sent her to bring me pineapple seeds. Her name is Inina. She has white, innocent eyes. I will not give up my work. Not until I have fried rice with pineapple and raisins. And not until I know exactly what is coming. Interference. Unborn. Eris deciphers the eighth message from the pyramid. This word is bound to creation, but presented here as falsehood. Something like unborn. We say guardians are rebirthed by light, but I do sometimes wonder. The choice to live again was not our own. Unborn. Report by Van Net Encrypted Router. It preaches the philosophy of the books of sorrow, your scriptures, and the unveiled fragments. The Traveler is a false creator, guarding its creations with false law. We are dead things made in the shape of the dead. The only true law is violent winnowing. Whatever cannot hold on to existence does not deserve existence. And so forth. At least it is consistent. Personal notes. Scratched in hive leather with a flake of Ionian stone. The enemy suggests that our rebirth was an evil mistake. How Gnostic. They were a cult. A fleet. A school. A horde. Who believed that the source of all suffering was not in our poor choices, but an error of the world's creator. A false and deluded god. Mara would laugh. Or weep. Was my rebirth an evil? It is true that guardians are reborn to face pain. We are endlessly besieged by a tortured cosmos. Secretly, I believe that most of us fall to exhaustion. Our ghosts love us and let us curl up inside to rest. My ghost briar died to save me. If she were returned, would I want immortality again? I do fear immortality without choice. I would not want to go on as a prisoner in Vex glass or a spirit trapped in the sea of screams. But my life is not a prison or 
a trap. Deep cut, full of stone dust. It is not. Interference. Purity. Eris deciphers the ninth message on the pyramid. This message translates to a state of decontamination, something like purity. Though this conjugation emphasizes loss, a purity through subtraction, willingly or otherwise. The darkness could be speaking to the taken memories of new guardians, or the boundaries we accept when we follow the light. The limitations forced upon us. Mm. In truth, it could refer to many things. The Singular Exegete. Purity. Report by Van Net Encrypted Router. This logograph suggests purification through reduction, ablution, or sacrifice. It may draw an ironic comparison between the Taken and our own relationship to the Traveler. I am sure the idea that we are light Taken is a popular heresy, but the difference should be plain. We do not lose the capacity to choose. We make our own fate. Personal notes, scratched in hive leather with a flake of Ionian stone. The translation is not as clear as I suggested to Zavala. As I told my friend, purity is hardly pure of meaning. There are many interpretations. As a student of hive law, purity makes me recall the final shape. That which remains when all that can be removed has been removed. But the Hive are a skeletal cult of misery and reduction. The true enemy is rich with nuance. It challenges me. Why does the Traveller strip us of our old identities? As a Guardian, I never craved a past. Everything I cared for was in front of me. I could see my people. I could touch them. I could fight for them. But then I lost my ghost and the light. Trapped in the gunpowder tunnels of the disemboweled moon, I cursed the traveler. It left no childhood memories to comfort me. No parents or cherished friends waiting in the city. No one to whom I could devote my return. Just Ariana, Sai, Omar, and Vel. Haunting me. Of course, I have never considered this before. There is a more generous interpretation of the Traveler's amnesia. The Traveler believes that if we are freed of our past wounds and fears, Given power and a new start, we will choose to be good. We will abandon all lesser causes to defend humanity. We will choose others over ourselves. Perhaps this is why the Traveller never speaks. Its voice is too loud to be anything but coercion. It waits, breathless, for us to make our own choice. A small space. Inina's ghost sent me a message. She found viable pineapple seeds in an arcology vault. She wants me to grow them. Interference. Conviction. Eris deciphers the tenth message from the pyramid. This is a term for action born out of supreme conviction, single-minded dedication, almost zealotry, driving extreme behavior. Great atrocities can be couched in valor, it suggests. Oh, wait. Not can be. Will be. Future tense. Interesting.
The Singular Exegy Conviction Report by Vannet Encrypted Router The enemy is convinced of the rightness of its cause. Uninteresting. Personal Notes Scratched in hive leather with a flake of Ionian stone. I saw a strange ghost yesterday, lurking among my supplies. Normally, they do not come this close. Even when their guardians do, they fear possession by the pyramid. But this one had the air of a spy. The enemy warns me of great atrocities couched in valour, violence born from supreme conviction. This message is an extension of the camouflage logograph, a warning against my own comrades. Sometimes death does not come from a disease, but the body's immune reaction. Under pressure, oxygen becomes poison. Good things, Mara says, can make us sick. Zavala is not a Martinet. He is a strategist. His guardians are all tacticians. They love when some grand new threat appears, but when it is defeated, they become restless, and they use their bold victories as proof that Zavala is a timid leader. But he is not swayed by the hot-blooded elite. He fears victory disease. What will happen when our mighty newborn guardians, accustomed to swift victory, meet a grinding, tedious foe? Any worries for the thousands and thousands of weaker lightbearers who rush after their heroes and die forever? No more ghosts are being created. We are pouring from a shallow cup. He would do anything to protect the last city. Such is his conviction. Would he kill me if he thought I was turned? I think it would wound him horribly. But he does love to be hurt by his duty. A small space. Inaina returned with the pine apple seeds. Io does not support agriculture. So I made loam out of treated soil, asteroid powder, and a bacterial paste that looks like bouillon. I will plant the pineapple seeds in this little garden. I hope their roots are not too big. I have only a little room to grow. Interference. Petulant. Eris deciphers the eleventh message from the Pyramid. This message isn't directed at us. One translation might be petulant. The equivalent of a condescending wave of its hand or a wagged finger. Like a parent rebukes a stubborn child. I think this might be meant for Savathun. The Singular Exegete Petulant Report by Vannet Encrypted Router A rebuke to Savathun for her interference. Perhaps she is jealous of our direct access to the pyramid. She led the hive to the darkness, but she has had eons to regret that choice. Could we exploit this? Personal Notes Scratched in hive leather the flake of Ionian stone. I find the Guardian's collective study humiliating. Their channels are full of open speculation about me. Is she a hapless lackey of Queen Mara, an ancient proto-hive matron? And why did she offer to trade a bag of quartz chip data stores for a pound of breadfruit? Savathun, queen of all encrypts. Savathun, who has distorted these messages so badly that only the tenacious drifter can unscramble them. Why does the hive trickster want to prevent our contact with her god? 
simplest answer. It is all a trick. You did exactly as I required, is her retort to any defeat. How can her plans be foiled when no one understands what they are? But would she dare defy the deep itself? Perhaps she would. Savathun's wretched existence is bound to the need to confuse. To understand her is to destroy her. She's still set on luring us into a black hole, some newborn universe where she can be a true god. Was that a lie too? Am I on the verge of some discovery that threatens her? Jupiter is always straight above. At night, the whole sky is afire. Tons of sulfur burning in the flux tube that connects Io to the Jovian pole. I burn my trash and the smoke drifts up forever. The radio howls like wolves. I... I'm lonely. Interference. Camouflage. Eris deciphers the twelfth message from the pyramid. This is a biological term like camouflage, but this wording pertains to stalking predators, specifically a carnivore disguising itself to get close to its prey. The darkness could mean this as a warning, or it could simply mean to sow dissension among us. The Singular Exegete Camouflage Report by Vannet Encrypted Router Meaning unclear Perhaps simply a threat We are hidden closer than you know Personal notes, knotted in a codex of hive gut. Now I am hiding the truth even from my own friend. I do not want to make them distrust the vanguard, but I am sure that this warning is genuine and that it points to a threat in our own ranks. There are inflections to this logograph that speak of a killer hidden in plain sight. I must not become paranoid, as Quan Shren did, but I think the warning is for me. I think the enemy wants me safe from my own kind, so that I will continue to receive its messages and share them with my friend. Is that my true purpose? Am I only a conduit for their corruption? I am convinced that the absolute interdict upon knowledge of the darkness is misguided. We can understand the enemy without falling under its sway. If I can pass through darkness and return, so can others. Perhaps under my guidance. Perhaps I can be a teacher. Mara would be horrified if she knew, afraid for me, but my queen herself stole Oryx's power. Can communion with the Black Fleet be so much more dangerous? I planted the pine apples. They have already blossomed. The Golden Age agriculturists must have tweaked them for growth and hardiness. Little purple thistles. They delight me. Inina asks after their health. I am suspicious of her. She is too eager to please. And who knows which faction that snooping ghost reports to. Was it hers? Duress and Egress Vance, or Specs. The music rang clear and true. Brother Vance listened, his face a paroxysm of glory. It repeats, he whispered to himself 
and the young warlock who was bent over the Infinite Forge, diligently crafting weapons from another age. She listened politely, but heard nothing. She went back to her task. Why do none pity the phoenix? The warlock looked up, startled. Vance was across from her, though she had not noticed his approach. His question came with no preamble, as if the two had been in the midst of a conversation. I'm sorry? offered the warlock. Endless rebirth true, each matched by a fiery death, Vance said. No sooner does it clean the ash from its feathers, does it fall again to flame. The blind man turned and bathed his face in the glowing sunlight that streamed into his sanctum. And none speak of its song. The warlock thanked Vance for the use of his forge, and stood to leave. You are more than welcome, he said without turning his head. Though his vacant smile had grown kind, he gestured toward the tomes and scrolls on his desk. Help yourself to a prophecy, friend, he said. I believe I have finally finished my studies. Interference. Falling. Eris deciphers the thirteenth message from the pyramid. This message denotes a continued inevitable movement. Falling would be a suitable translation, though the outcome here is not necessarily negative. The die is cast, as the light from a distant star takes time to reach our eyes, an event we cannot yet perceive has already occurred. Hmm. The Singular Exegy Falling Report by Van Net Encrypted Router Another threat of imminent disaster. You declared a new golden age, and our enemy declares a second collapse. They imply it is already in motion. Alarming. Personal notes. Scored in hive leather with a knife. Freefall is indistinguishable from a stable orbit until you strike the ground. Are we already falling? Is our doom fixed? Have I missed the signs this time? I should ask Osiris. I should ask Ikora. I should ask my queen. I should conjure wretched Toland from the sea of screams and wring the truth from him. But would I be believed? There goes old Eris, they will say, howling about fingertips and revenge again. She is lonely. So she prophesies doom. Zavala would believe me, but he would also call me in for rest. Ikora would set me in a library and take care of me, and I would be too glad of it to leave. I cannot. I cannot. Even my queen knows that some secrets must be kept in solitude. She will understand. She trusts me. I look forward to sharing a meal together. Beyond Arrivals Covering a selection of seasonal armour, item and weapon entries, foreshadowing the events of Beyond Light and Season of the Hunt. Old fast mark. Jolly until knelt before the throne, his eyes on the floor. He didn't enter the Black Garden to defy you. He did it to impress you. Why else would he risk so much? You're the only thing in the universe that would drive him to such lengths. He could feel the Queen's cold glare boring a hole through the top of his head. Is that meant as an excuse, Jolly on? 
the Queen seethe, because it sounds remarkably petty, childish even. The darkness is not something to be toyed with. Who knows what you might have awakened? My decree was for our protection. As my most trusted crow, I would have thought you understood that. Yes, my queen, I understand. Marasov slowly descended from her days, looming over her childhood friend, her subject. You say you understand, yet you directly disobeyed my command to avoid that place. She bent forward at the waist until her lips were nearly brushing his ear. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Is this treason? The word echoed silently through the empty throne room. Jolion's blood froze. Please, my queen, try to understand. Aldrin is your kin by birth, by blood. There is nothing you wouldn't do for each other. He paused, choosing his next words carefully. He is your brother, but he's mine as well. He saved my life more times than I can count. Uh, not just in battle. He saved me from despair. From self-doubt. When LaVisca died, when my world was crumbling, he saved me from myself. As emotion welled up within him, Jolion found the courage to raise his head and meet the Queen's lofty gaze. Aldrin is my brother too. I love him and I would follow him anywhere. I would follow him into death if he asked, just as he would for you. If you call that treason, so be it. Hold fast, Cloak. Aldrin? Jolly Until gently prompted his oldest friend. The normally sharp awoken prince had drifted off again. Aldrin snapped back to reality with a shake of his head. Is that... Yes. Wind 17 kph from your 6 o'clock. One degree off spin north. Aldrin squinted downrange, as if peering into the sun. Jolion frowned. The sun was behind them. This was the first time he and Aldrin had been to the range since their return from the Black Garden, and Jolion was shocked by how hollowed out his friend looked. Jolion couldn't quite put his finger on what had changed, but there was definitely something new in Aldrin's eyes. Something terribly familiar. Uh, sending it. Jolion pulled the trigger and missed by 30 meters. That's how far the calculations had shifted during his moment of hesitation. Jolion grimaced. Nice shot, Aldrin muttered. You always were the best. Jolion didn't even bother to hide his concern. It was clear that Aldrin was also plagued by the nightmares. The nocturnal visions Jolion dared not mention aloud. The grotesque beating heart mangled by Vex technology, slimy with overripe pulp, thorny wires reaching outward. The wet, mechanical thump, the dark, beating heart, the thick, beating heart. Jolion snapped too. He had been drifting. He looked up to find the Awoken Prince squinting down at him, as if trying to spot something in the distance. Something barely visible, and receding further by the day. Hold fast, Bond. I used to hate his stupid pranks. Like this one time, back when we were still in combat academy together, he tried to dye my dark green uniform bright yellow, which was obviously never going to work. Jolion swirls the ice cubes around in his glass, listening to their soft clinking. I put it on in the morning without noticing, wore the damn thing through a whole 22-hour rotation. By the end of the day, it had stained my skin, 
turned my whole body from blue to bright green. Maybe that was his plan all along. Jolion says and chuckles. For a moment, the bartender can see the happy-go-lucky guy that might once have been. But that was typical of Aldrin. Try something outrageous, only to fail more successfully than he ever intended. And just as quickly as it came, the grin fades, and he's just another traumatized soldier once again. He was never a bad person. Not until the end, anyway. He used to be... funny. In a kind of irritating, charming way. Like he knew that whatever it was, he was going to get away with it. And he usually did. Right up until the Black Garden. That was the day he pushed his luck too far. And I helped him do it. I helped turn my best friend into a monster. Jolion taps the rim of his glass, and the bartender pours another. Yeah, I used to hate his stupid pranks. And his arrogance. But now that he's gone, that's the stuff I miss. Awakened Shell some fall and mistrust my interest in human artifacts. Find it distasteful. Or they think it makes me a sympathizer. The spider chuckles wholesomely, as if I could experience sympathy. The fallen mob boss holds a mint condition ghost shell before his right two eyes. The shell looks fragile in his enormous spindly fingers. In truth, I like to see their emptiness. The absence where the light once was. The scent of an empty perfume bottle. He turns his attention to the hunter standing before him. Of course, once I sell it to you, it'll just be filled with light again. Yammering away, using your vulgar desire for power to fulfill its true purpose. The hunter's trigger finger begins to twitch with impatience. Well, if you want to keep it, I'll be happy to put your bounty back in the wind. He toe pokes the prone form lying on the ground before him. A muffled snarl emerges from behind the bag over its head. Everyone remain calm, the hunter's ghost pipes in. I need a new shell. You need this prisoner. This is an equitable situation. We agree. See? It's obvious who works for who here. The spider tosses the ghost shell to the hunter. Fine. Take it. Just remember. One day, you may outlive your usefulness. That little ghost will drop you for another walking corpse. When that happens, I'll be waiting. Warden's Wailer. The spider steeples all twenty of his fingers, and looks down imperiously from his throne. Standing before him is a warlock, their armour scuffed and dinged. They're unarmed. You guardians look out at the tangled shore, all the violence and lies. You think you're above it? But like humans used to say before the collapse, if you sleep with the beasts, you're gonna get dirty. The spider leans forward, examining the rumpled guardian. You've got terribly dirty, warlock. And it shows. Just look at you. Though the warlock crosses their arms defiantly, the spider can sense the shame burning behind the ferocious metal helmet. He chuckles deeply. Luckily, there's still time to salvage your honor. Nobody needs to know of your transgression. Fire teams disappear all the time out here. Only a few people know it was you, and I could persuade the witnesses to forget all about it. In return, 
All you have to do is serve my best interest. The spider leans forward, his voice lowering into a growl. Otherwise, you're on your own. There's nothing to stop me from taking everything you've got right now. Your weapons, your sparrow, the very armor on your back. I may not be able to kill you, but I'll harvest you for every last part. The spider opens his bottom pairs of arms magnanimously. So, how about it? The warlock sneer is audible. I'd rather lose my light than work for you. The spider motions to his goons, who raise their weapons. Pride, pride, pride. It was all the vanguard's failing. Very well, then. Strip. False promises. The spider eyes the drifter, boots to bandana. Mm, my favorite. Spider trails off with a drag of ether to select a title befitting the drifter. Nothing. You think this'll take? The drifter says and nods skyward, kicking an empty ether canister off the side of their floating motor reef. Red streaks burn in the star sea sky beyond the vast clouds of asteroids and dust, drawing the shape of a new constellation as the war mind launches fresh guns. An almighty effort. Splendid. Spider steps off a transit craft, alone. We could have met in a more protected place. You don't like being seen with me? The spider is a friend to all, but not all my friends are friends. Spider says and focuses his gaze on the drifter. You should have come to me. You keep too many bodies around. Bodies can stab you in the back. Running shows your back. The spider's voice shudders. To everyone. Drifter pauses a moment and looks around at the desolate scape. Small boulders hang in space. They slowly drift toward each other, make contact, and bounce away on random trajectories. Some stick, incorporated via destructive consummation. He scowls and turns back to Spider. Stretch your legs. No one here for miles. The Spider unfurls himself slurping a heavy, vacuumous drag from his rebreather. Fully upright, he dwarfs the drifter in shadow. Isolation is not the same as protection, friend. Friendship gonna save us from what's coming? Drifter asks. He places his fingertips together, the space between his hands resembling a triangle. The odds aren't in your favour, but... A guttural laugh ripples from Spider's belly, and sends vibration through the loose-packed dirt underfoot. I'm the wrong one to come to for comfort. I get it. You tried running last time. It didn't work. Now you're trying to hide. Let me give you some advice. That don't work either. Hiding? The spider asks and waits. The board changes. The board clears. I don't play. I just price the pieces. Cold-blooded. World's ending and you want to run for all it's got. End is a matter of perspective. Devastation is often time. He says with a breath. Profitable. What if nothing's left? Skin and bones? There's always ivory among the bones. Bull. Spider slings a single breathy. Ha. You remind me of my compatriots. Spider wraps his finger around a small clod of earth drifting by. They looked at the whirlwind just like you. Scared. He closes his hand, crushing the clod into a dense mound. It fractures 
into several pieces that waft away as Spider releases his grip. But here we are, living on anyway. Yeah. Fallen. Fallen. I hold favor among witches and kells and whispering agents of every shade and shape. My web is vast, and I have proven useful. Let the kings bloody each other. I'll direct the runner. You talking about guardians? I hate to break it to you, but they're a cheap date. Cheap is malleable. Cheap becomes cheap in desperation. Yeah. The drifter pulls a small and ornate box of awoken design from his rucksack. Who you looking for with this anyway? The spider steps toward Drifter, smothering his personal space. Options, my dear rogue. Tangled in the web. He takes the box with his dominant arms and plops two stuffed sacks of ghost shells into the Drifter's hands with his others. Went through hell to get that little box. Don't come with no throw. Drifter says, holding his voice steady, your tense to stay the trembling. The spider chitters as a shiver runs through him. No. Just a looking glass window. Good business, friend. The hulking fallen Don turns to leave. Remember. Remain useful. When you find him, you sure the past won't come knocking? No one minds the spider. Lucky. Temptation's Hook You ferried a light bearer to the outer system, Orna says, and cocks the hammer on her weapon. They did not return with you. I learned the secret. The one your hounds have hidden away in that quaint little vault. Solar smiles red through split lips. You're on the losing side. Do you think you have nothing to lose? that I wouldn't take it from you? You're sorely, and soon to be regretfully, mistaken. Sola spits in Orna's face. You have limits. You have masters. A twisted light shimmers in Sola's hand as she moves to attack. Enjoy hanging to death in your strings. Orna pulls the trigger unflinchingly. Sola drops. Disgrace of a war. Sola's ghost hangs motionless in the air beside her dead charge. A breeze rustles char from the patches of blackened grass around them. Her iris flicks next to the two praxic watchdogs, the warlock who pulled the trigger, and the titan partner who shakes her recent death from his bones. Orna turns to her colleague. Should we have her resurrected and ask again? The titan wipes blood from his chest plate as his ghost patches his armor. A fresh bullet hole sits above his heart. No, I think she made herself clear the first time. Sola's ghost pipes up. Who says I would? You have nothing to fear, little light. Your guardian is... touched. We are here to help. You mean you're here to put us down? Not presently. Give us the coordinates of your heading. Then... You'll be escorted to the city in peace. You know. If you didn't, we wouldn't be here. We've tracked the gravitational disturbances, yes. The war mind had revealed the anomaly was moving through the outer system. But you know that, and you know how to find it. The ghost mimics a spit noise. Run back to your quiet traveller. I won't be ordered around anymore. Orna's body deflates as she holsters her weapon. Bahagari he says. A ghost appears at Orna's side. Prepare our tools. This one appears touched as well. Bahagari nods and slips away to follow the order. The striker titan approaches and snaps his fingers. A stunning bolt of lightning pelts Sola's ghost out of the air and into unconsciousness. It's affecting ghosts now, too? 
should bring them back to the city. This makes five. He picks up the ghost and shoulders Sola's body before shuffling off to their ship. Orna turns to follow. Five and counting. She whispers to herself without taking her eyes off Sola's ghost. Whispering Slab Eris Morn walks with slow, silent steps toward a haggard drifter shoving small bags into larger ones. Dim and exhausted moats lie scattered throughout the derelict, slowly evaporating. She retrieves a moat from the floor and shines her burning light over the cracked surface. The light struggles to leave the cracks. She lets the disintegrating moat drop and shatter into dust against the floor grates. It chimes like resonant glass. The drifter whirls around to face the noise, almost losing his footing. He lets his hand slide off his holstered trust as recognition washes over him. Ain't nobody ever tell you not to skulk? It's rude. Noted. Are you vacating? Road trip? How'd you get here anyway? The airlock was open. Uh-huh. If I said I were here to run in your rat race, would it change your tune? Uh-huh. Eris drops her shoulders and approaches the drifter. I want your help. Uh-huh. His brown furrows with suspicion. Why? Didn't you save the universe yet? Drifter turns back to shoving bags and bags. It seems to be continually in peril. To be honest, I'm not sure I've helped. Eris hands him a bag. I need your knowledge. You? No. I have had some troubling experiences as of late. Yeah, it's called life. I need to know, she says and hesitates, half-hearted restraint preceding sacrilege. Tell me how to interpret the darkness. What am I, some crusty woo-woo sage? Beat it, kid. Pack it. Do not ignore me, Eris says. Her voice is calm and piercing. We've both seen beneath the surface. Drifter drops the pack in his hand and picks a jade coin off his workbench. Asher is entrenched in his thinking she says, and gently places a palm down on the workbench beside them. Ikora, she tries, she hears, but she doesn't understand. No one is listening. Drifter pockets the coin and turns to face her. He stares deep. Experience. Hell of a thing. He looks down the gangway of the derelict and through the gate that would take him to his hall. Favors ain't free. I do this. You owe me. Eris nods. Drifter swipes the workbench clean and pulls out a retractable seat for himself. How long you got? The two sit. They speak. They listen. Linkages forged in light and dark of traded secrets as the derelict hangs in orbit around the earth. Pacts are made. Soon, there is only the silence of knowing left between them. Next time you fly over the moon, dust your boots. Tracking that crap all over my floors. Eris shakes her head and moves toward the airlock. Drifter yells after her. And call next time. I could have blown those fancy eyes straight out of your face. I'll try to be more mindful of your many eccentricities in the future. Rhymed Shell Access Restricted Decryption Key Orn 326 Rep 1287 Fallen Dev Agent Ran 187 Countercultural Intelligence Update 
All in presence on RZ-724. Niflheim has surged since the lunar incident. There is no clear indication of a cause beyond increased enemy activity since the incident. Records indicate the presence of a highly dangerous artifact or entity on RZ-724, but all primary source field reports are so heavily corrupted as to be useless for investigation. Report 324 Anom AICOM As an extra reef territory, RZ-724 has been historically considered an NFZ. Until the Dreaming City Crisis, viable inbound flight paths were strictly controlled by the Awoken. Their misfortune has opened new horizons for our intelligence efforts. Further, if the Awoken are aware of the fallen activity, they have yet to act, and we cannot rely on the initiative of unpredictable allies. The faction swarming RZ-724 is led by VIP number 2029, with a contingent of other fallen VIPs, 5340, 5341, and 5342. The unnamed faction appears to be an amalgamation of former House Devils, House Wolves, and House Dusk members, though VIP 2029 seems to have unexpectedly abandoned the banner of House Devils. Unverifiable reports indicate that VIP 1121 is among the group, though whether as a co-conspirator or a prisoner, this agent does not know. I am recommending immediate action. Several well-outfitted fire teams should be sent to RZ-724 for further reconnaissance and retaliation. This may take resources away from the current containment efforts on afflicted planets, but swift action will stop a fallen insurrection before it happens. Whatever is buried on RZ-724 must be kept out of enemy hands at all costs. Arrival Seasonal Story, Part 3 Concluding the law books Duress and Egress, and The Singular Exegete The final seasonal quests and interactions and covering the web law, they're not coming. An exotic traveler's chosen. Empathic Shell. Those in the city looked at the sky uneasily. The pyramid could show up at any time. There would be a sudden noise, or worse, no noise, and there would be a shadow. Did something that dark cast a shadow? And then it would be there, above them in the sky. Or it would land, some said. Something would fire out of it. Or it would greedily consume the planet. Or maybe something would walk out. And that would be the end. Simple as that. And there was nothing they could do. Then they looked toward the tower and imagined great plans forming. They saw figures pacing above them, gazing up at the traveller, gazing down at them. There was comfort in the belief that something was being done, although it didn't allay the anxiety of wondering if the ship would come now, if the last moment was now, or now, or now. So the people of the city went inside, because even though a layer of metal and plaster wouldn't protect them from the ship, it stopped them from looking at the sky for a while. They busied themselves. Those with the know-how patched roofs or laid nanoscale cables or sewed clothing. When they finished, they did the same for others who needed it. Some of them tinkered with alloy recasters and teased metal decorations out of the air. Those who preferred more traditional materials raised clouds of sawdust as they worked hardwood. The shivering trill of an ether saw played a duet with the clack clacking loom. Now showered with attention, household gardens flourished. Tables held heaping bowls of 
cold, spicy salad. Vinegar poured over dark green leaves with orange stems. There was potato soup with chopped green onions and fresh golden peas. There was crusty bread baked with herbs. And the people sat in circles, families and neighbors passing bowls of hot soup. They ran their hands over smooth wooden sideboards, admired paintings, held soft blankets in their laps. Instead of looking at the sky, they looked at each other. Exodus Evacuation Zavala looks over the city, preparing for battle across four fronts. We're spread too thin, he says quietly. As of now, our plan changes from preparation to evacuation. He takes a measured breath. For a moment, he looks old. Sloane asked whether we could spare a vanguard ship to relocate important cargo. Coming from her, that's a full-on distress call. Head to Titan, help her tie up loose ends, bring her home. I have also been in contact with Ashamir on Io. He insists the data he's gathering is too important to abandon. Of course, his phrasing was a bit more colourful. You nod. Thank you, Guardian, he says reflexively. It's clear his mind is far away. Evacuation. Clearing the decks. You're back, Sloane says. I've been sending supplies to Zavala, but I'm not finished here. Not yet. The Hive's preparing a massive ritual beneath the Arcology. Get in there and stop them. They want us to back off. Which means we push harder. There's also activity on the surface. Some kind of Hive treasurer has been dredging up Golden Age tech. And I've been letting it. She raises a hand to quiet your protest. They've been looking for something specific. And they finally found it. You just have to go pick it up. The Guardian helps out by completing these tasks. Sloan takes the recovered tech and listens to your report. Savathun, she repeats. So it's worse than I thought. I was able to do a little research on this tech. Pieces of survival gear from the Golden Age. They're just my size. When that ship decides to land, I'll be here to deal with whatever walks out of it. The resolute look in Sloane's eyes stops you from speaking. When it all started, me, Zavala, Shax, we didn't build the wall. We were the wall. The unbreakable woman's voice is unexpectedly soft. I told Zavala once. I was there for the beginning. I'll be there for the end. She smiles, her crow's feet crinkle. It's not the end yet. Sloan, Rhea Strad. After she watched the Guardian's ship roar off Titan for the last time, Deputy Commander Sloan went into her office and put on the Golden Age technology she had claimed from the Hive. The heavy power source hung from her shoulders like a bandolier. She draped it across her neck and stepped into the suit, fast and clumsy. As she bowed her head into the grey hood, a view screen appeared before her. She did not understand the language, not yet, but chose the green option. With a hiss, the suit conformed to her shape. It was heavy, but she had full range of movement. She focused on her arm, concentrated, and the material scabbed into thick, armoured plates. That was something. She tried to form arc energy, but the suit blocked her light. Or perhaps she would have to learn how to flex her light through her suit. She selected another option with her eyes, 
and selected again to confirm. There was no pain as she felt the suit snake a cold tube through her side and coil somewhere near her stomach. That answered a few of her questions. Sloane lurched outside. There was a storm, like Titan was trying to drive off the invader that sat lazily in its sky. She walked into the gale, and the rain beaded on her second skin. Each step was easier than the last as the suit adjusted to her gait. A cymbal flashed, and a hive thrall charged her. She gripped it by its neck and arm before tearing it apart. It was so easy. She laughed then, and the suit interpreted it as a battle cry and amplified it, broadcasted it. The sound echoed off the discarded shipping containers on the rainy landing pads, echoed through Siren's watch and up toward the pyramid. Lightning flashed in the sky, and the storm raged on. Evacuation Observer Effect As he relays Zavala's message to Asher, he grins dryly. He values my safety over documenting galaxy-saving knowledge. How noble, he says and waves away Zavala's concern. If that is all the bureaucrat had to say, there are several tasks requiring your attention. Ikora told me of unusual take and activity nearby, but I did not make it a priority. You must correct that oversight. In addition, an altered taken roams the nearby caves. Fetch a sample so that I may probe it for dark influence. Most importantly, venture into the Pyramidium and search for scan evidence. I believe the dark ships came here for the same reason as I. The scientist raises an eyebrow. Paracausal as they may be, perhaps they are not beyond scientific curiosity. The Guardian carries out these tasks, and then returns to Asher. Asher studies the data you bought him. I finally see, he says. If the darkness claims the Pyramidian, it will dissect it for study, unfold its innumerable dimensions, wade through its multitudinous seas, peer through its crackling warp gates leading to a million millions of new realities. Asher's voice drops low and quiet. I will not allow it. If something steps out of that ship and descends down the pulsing electric corridors of the Pyramidian, through the infinite swirling cantor dust of its interior, they will find me in its heart, on the shores of my Radiolarian Lake. Asher's arm emits a steady mechanical thrum, and I will be ready for them. Duress and Egress Asher Conclusion As Ashamir watched his assistant ship tear into orbit for the last time, it occurred to him that he had not expressed how truly satisfactory he had found some of their work. He briefly entertained the thought of leaving a letter, but there were others more deserving of his thoughts, and if he worked in descending priority, he might never make it to his assistant which would defeat the purpose of the exercise completely. Instead, he went to the Pyramidium. The Vex are not born, yet not created. Desire to understand this conundrum brought Asher to Io. He reasoned that the Pyramid, with its alien resources and unknowable power, had likely come for the same purpose. The Dark Ship sought to take the secrets of the Vex for itself. But Ashadmir had already staked his claim, and he was prepared to defend it. He soon stood at the gate of the Pyramidium. The Vex security responded as he knew they would, and he was prepared. He piled their broken corpses on the plates and continued inside. He destroyed the first hundred Vex, then the second. A minotaur roared into being before him, and he crushed its radiolarian core in his metal fist. He 
he climbed forward over their clawing limbs. He slipped in the cooling roux of their dead fluid. Asher swallowed a mouthful of blood and kept moving. He paused by a whirling gate and watched the aperiodic waves, then stepped through at the only possible moment. He walked steadily through laser grids that seemed to bend around him. He hung calmly in a gravitational tourbillon as the ground beneath him flickered and shifted madly. The Vex began to observe. The corridors of the Pyramidion were lined with glowing red eyes. The metal mannequin stood dumbly, twitching, shuddering as Asher passed. A familiar area unfolded before him, a cubist sinkhole reeking with the flat, base stench of slate mud and bleach. He looked where the sky should be and found another impossible shape, another fractal contradiction. Far above him, placid in its Penrose vortex, the vast Radiolarian lake lapped gently at the metallic shores. The man reached up to the lake with his metal arm. He then reached with his arm of flesh. He reached with both. He brought the lake down. Evacuation. A shattered future. Brother Vance recognizes your footsteps and brightens as you enter his sanctum. I believe I could refine traces of Osiris, he says with hushed excitement, to allow one entrance to the infinite forest. There was a time I could not contemplate such an honor. Quantum cracks yawn in the forest where echoes of Vex, Hive, Cabal, and Osiris swirl in a gyre. Strike these stress points, and I could seal the forest from within. You notice Vance's hands are balled tightly at his sides. The pyramids draw close. Through this system and beyond, the lightless are filled with fear. I am no Osiris, true, but in my small way, I will bring light to their darkness. There is clarity in his voice. I will tell them they must believe. The Guardian helps out with Vance's tasks. Brother Vance listens to your report with great interest. When you are finished, he smiles serenely. You have done me a great kindness, he says. I regret I cannot join you in the city. For a long moment he stands peacefully in his cluttered sanctuary. I met Osiris once, Vance says. Bright music, he told me, among other things. The sacred tones came from the lighthouse. The words are my own. No, not the tale of Osiris. My song is not one of worship, but one of hope, shining brightly in the dark. I will walk into the infinite forest and spread hope. He gives you a beatific smile. Hope for the future. Duress and Egress. Vance, Asiri. After the Guardian left his sanctum for the last time, Brother Vance collected his few belongings and stepped onto the scorching surface of Mercury. He found the entrance to the infinite forest easily, so he had practiced this journey endlessly in his mind. Because he had. This time, he went through. The forest roared. He was struck by the dizzying void of it. The echoes made no sense. He took his first step into the hallowed place and fell to his knees, vomiting. He struggled with his pack as a tempest beat on his eardrums. He withdrew his infinite simulacrum, impossibly small in this immense space, and with trembling figures 
synchronized it to the frequency of the crack in the forest. It ticked like a metronome. And then, silence. The forest was sealed. Tentatively, Vance felt his way across the enormous stone he stood on. At the same time, he skipped effortlessly from the stone, as if he had done so countless times before. At the same time, he soared. He was moving in every direction, bawling, laughing, singing, down every path into every reality, spreading his message of hope. And the original, the true Vance, felt his infinite parallels erupt from him. He felt them bear him up as they passed. Thank you, he said wordlessly, unable to breathe from joy, and felt a hundred thousand touches of reassurance. He found he was weeping. There, in the swirl of his golden echoes, Brother Vance lifted his voice and began his song. Some hope for his own voice answered him from behind. The future, it continued. Vance leapt toward it. He recognized the feel of his own cloak, and his hands found its throat. Its form twisted, turning cold and sharp beneath his hands. It threw Vance on his back, but he held on, pushed his hands up the thing's face, under its blindfold and dug in with his thumbs. It howled. How unfortunate, Vance thought to himself behind his wide smile. You still have eyes. Evacuation. Signs of life. I'm glad Zavala sent you back down, Anna says and smiles. He's been asking after Red. It's sweet. Here's what I've learned. When he was attacked, Rasputin pushed some of his signal back along the comms relay. He'd be disguised as something benign. We need to find it. We can also help the Vanguard. Mars Hive are using a ritual to strengthen Savathun. Disrupt it. And while you have your weapon drawn... He gestures out the window where towers jut from crimson dunes. Enact escalation protocol. Attract Hive all the Hive you can, and do what you do. She takes his breath. He's still out there, she says. We're both counting on you. The Guardian helps out with Anna's tasks. Anna asks you to wait. I have to do some brain surgery with a soldering iron, she says. Soon she pushes back from her desk. Blocky black chunks of metal and exposed wiring wreath a small cracked view screen. Her voice is hushed, as if a child was sleeping. There wasn't as much left as I had hoped. A fraction of a percent. But it's him. She carefully lifts the frame. He's light, she says in surprise. Then, louder. You in there, Red? The screen flickers soft orange. Anna beams as she turns to you. Let Zavala know I'll bring Rasputin to the tower. Whatever happens next, we'll face it together. Rasputin's screen pulses weakly with blue tones, then holds strong. A rich, vibrant purple. Duress and Egress Anna, Black Box As Anna Bray watched the Guardian Sparrow rocket across Hellas Basin for the last time, she saw a confidant who had believed in her when no one else would. That faith, Zavala had reminded her, was a bond with more power than all the Warmind weapons in the system. It was a promise to go on an agreement that there was still a future. Ginger had called it Reverse Salvage. She knew a thing or two about building something from the wreckage of their past. The building was nearly empty. 
she had sent as much tech to the tower as they could handle. An entire freight vessel's worth, packed to bursting. She turned to the large glass window overlooking silent Warsat cannons. There were no cabal. The death buried beneath Mars had quieted. Valkyrie subroutines that could be maintained remotely remained active, just in case. Jinju ran final checks on the jump ship. A dark pyramid loomed overhead. An experimental exo chassis was secured in the ship's cargo hold. One foot in front of the other. Exodus Evacuation The Guardian makes a final report to Zavala. So this is how it ends. Anna Brave will join us in the tower with what she salvaged of Rasputin. But the rest... Let Brother Vance chase shadows. We can waste no more time trying to stop him. Ashamir will stand and fight. He still has the heart of a guardian. And Deputy Commander Sloan. She plans to meet the pyramid above Titan head on, one woman against the darkness. What more could I have done? I tried to unite the Vanguard, but now we lie splintered in the face of the Dark Fleet. All we have left is our faith. Faith in the Traveler, faith in the Light, faith in you. They're not coming. Those words have finality when said aloud, an indirect farewell. Zavala can't quite see Ikora's expression in the muted reflection from his office window but he can hear the disappointment in her voice. Beyond the glass, the city seems agnostic to the tempest of emotions. Ships soar through the night sky. Lights glitter against the dark. The Traveler looms silently. I know, is Zavala's belated reply. He watches as Ikora's reflection reaches toward him, but he's still surprised when he feels the weight her hand against his shoulder. I want to commend them for their bravery, he says, confiding in her. But I'd prefer they be here to berate them for their foolishness. Ikora wordlessly squeezes Zavala's shoulder in response, before standing beside him at the window. I remember when you and I felt invincible. When our ghosts felt invincible and we could lay the foundation for the future with our bare hands. But now, it's different. The list of names to memorialize gets longer by the day, she says, watching Debris slowly orbit the Traveler. We've said goodbye to too many friends over the years. And who is left to join us now? Rasputin? To think that I welcomed him in. Zavala says, turning his back to the window and the Traveler, only to find out he betrayed the Iron Lord all those years ago. He looks across the data pads on his desk, jaw clenching. Are we that desperate that we're willing to accept mass murderers? He settles into his chair with a heavy sigh, lifting a hand to his forehead, eyes shut. Zavala. Ikora's voice is stern, but tempered with concern, as she follows him to his desk, her fingers curled against her palms. Stronger together, remember? We aren't abandoning anyone now. The slight quaver in her voice belies her confidence. Most people wouldn't notice, but Zavala has known her for over a century. When their eyes meet, she sees an unvoiced burden on his face that would appear to anyone else as merely stoic and unflinching. She sits on the corner of his desk, hands folded in her lap. You know, they'd all be lost without you, she affirms. He doesn't answer, but she can tell he agrees. I would have been lost 
without you. When Zavala starts to counter her argument, she continues over him, unrelenting. Out there, thousands of people look up to us as a sign of hope. We need that. Everyone does. It feels like I'm lying to them. Everyone. Zavala interrupts. The darkness is here. We're facing the end of all things, and I... Closes his eyes. I feel helpless. Ikora shakes her head and gives Zavala's shoulder another squeeze. Maybe we are. It seems a poor thing to say at first, but she continues. Even so, helpless doesn't mean hopeless. We forget that sometimes, and instead of embracing our faith in moments like this, we often turn against it out of fear and doubt. When I found my faith diminished, I exiled myself to Io. I questioned everything, including the Traveler. He levels a knowing look at Zavala, who also recalls how that chapter of their lives ended. What has the Traveler ever done for us? Zavala exclaims, his words strained through gritted teeth as he slaps his palm against his desk. Ikora gently lifts her hand from his shoulder and searches for her old friend's face. She understands the pain behind his words and recognizes the wave of anger in his eyes as it recedes. She rises from the corner of his desk, walking back to the window. I'm sorry, Zavala mumbles after the fact. It's all right, Ikora replies, gazing up at the Traveler hanging weightlessly over the city, illuminated by its light. If nothing else, the Traveler did one thing right by us. It takes a moment for Zavala to respond to her candor. And what was that? He asks, rising from his chair. Ikora watches Zavala's reflection in the glass, little more than a dim silhouette glowing eyes. She smiles softly, and he can see a moment of peace and relief in her expression. A moment of faith. A moment of truth. It brought us together. Interference. Contact. The Guardian finally confronts Nocris, who has been helping Savathun create the interference that has stopped us from communicating fully with the pyramids. Enemies of the light swarm the roots of the great tree. Bring the seed and banish them once more. As the Guardian approaches the cradle and tree of silver wings, which has become tarnished over the weeks of the season, two taken wizards complete a ritual, and the tree of silver wings turns a deep black, suffused by darkness and emitting the orange resonance regularly encountered near the pyramids. After dispatching the taken, the Guardian is pulled into Savathun's court in the Ascendant Plane. You are a child reaching toward a flame. The Taken Queen would not have you burnt. Pledge your allegiance and be reborn. Nocris. Oryx's foundling and exiled brother to Crota. He is now bound to Savathun as a catalyst for her interference. Silence it. In an arena sharing the same layout as the Court of Oryx from the Dreadnought, the Guardian encounters Nocris bearing the title Supplicant to Savathun. Our shackles are strong. We must be strong to break them. Life and dark are locked blades. A logic simple and narrow. A bridge with only one path. Liar's tools. Weave your own lie. Be taken and see endless possibility awaken.
Nacris is an abomination. His name stricken from the world's grave. You've done well to purge his stain from this failing court. Why would Sabathun work with him? With? Nacris is an exploited outcast, Little Light. A necromancer. Though I'm sure the Taken Queen saw value in his craft. Death rituals to buck the worm's game. I dare not wonder how she meant to wield that knowledge. We shouldn't dwell on it, you know. He's not coming back from that. Good riddance. Savathun's haze has diminished considerably, though not completely. She's still out there, hiding. Then I hope she saw what became of her brood. Hold still. I will fetch you. Don't you see? It is as we once said. In light, there is only weakness. Only failure. Only death. But where the light takes, the dark gives. No longer will you be a pawn. No longer will you watch the lives of those you care for be lost. Remember, in darkness there is only strength, only victory, only life. Ancient power awaits you on Europa. This transmission can be translated as contact. Not physical, more ethereal. Influential. It is conjugated here as an action with a singular subject, but innumerable objects. Guardian, what if we are not the only ones to whom the darkness speaks? The Singular Exegy. Contact. Report by Vannet Encrypted Router. At last. Another substantive message. The enemy's influence in our system may be more extensive than we realize. You must look for signs of its effect. Errors or crashes in Vex constructs. Eruptions of empowered or self-destructive hive sorcery. Newly created scorn. Revels and expeditions by the worshippers of the Narcissist Emperor. That's all known. Shaved into quartz with a surgical stylus. Our enemies are turning to the darkness. The Red Legion is broken, the Almighty destroyed. The remaining Cabal will either join Callus's death cult or seek his daughter Keitel. And the Fallen? We have driven them to the edge of survival, turned them against each other. How many will look to the whirlwind for an advantage over their rivals? By pushing them from the light, we have groomed more supplicants for the darkness. We are in an arms race. If we do not learn to use our greater enemy's power, our lesser enemies surely will. I confronted Inina about the strange ghost. It was not hers, she protested. I asked her why she had been so generous to me, so eager to please. She confessed that she had come on behalf of her fire team, guardians who are champions in the drift of strange games. They wish to learn the ways of the darkness itself, to descend into the underworld like ancient Inanna, and return. They want what I have learned here. How easily they might be corrupted. And yet, it thrills me to know that I would not be alone in my work. I sent her away. I fear the Witch Queen spies. The pine apple blossoms are still growing, but now I stare at the purple flowers in the black soil, and I wonder about poison. I am no longer hungry.
Vanguard alert. As the Pyramid Fleet's oppression intensifies, the Traveller reacts. It reforms and repairs its prior damage, and is able in some way to halt the Pyramid Fleet's advance. People of the last city, humanity has endured a devastating blow. Vanguard scouts have confirmed that Io, Mars, Titan, and Mercury have disappeared. We don't know why. We have lost contact with Deputy Commander Sloan and Jensen scribe Ashamir. We are deploying guardians to all corners of the system to find answers. And with those answers, we will form a plan. In the meantime, we ask that all lightless civilians remain within the safety of the city walls, under the protection of the traveler. Do not lose hope. Humanity has survived many horrors. We have done so through the strength of our community, through steadfast commitment to one another. Stay strong. Be brave. The Traveler protects us, and we will protect you. The Guardians will come through. They always do. Travelers Chosen I push into my Ossific den and he is there. I see him looking over the side, toward his traveller, head bent. He is speaking softly, but I can hear him. Anyone who was listening could. He waits for a response, and I do as well, tense, curious. He stands attentively, this loyal dog of a man, it is no time at all for me, but for him, the hours creep by in silence. I am ready to choke the voice of his traveller, if it answers him. But there is nothing. He tightens his grip on the railing. I feel something shift inside him, and a new possibility presents itself. Again, I press against the sockets. The net creaks softly with my eagerness. Someone approaches, and he turns his back to his traveller. There is an exchange, obscured by the Rubicon thrash. He is given reports. Hope leads from him. He gives the messenger a token of his faith. They accept it without understanding its meaning. He watches as they leave. There is a hollow place in his center. It is beautiful. I return warily. I do not see him, but I hear him. He speaks to all with a voice thick with grief. I must learn how far I have been set back. I reach to him tentatively. Strength. I push and feel only sweet, soft rock. I am delirious with pleasure. It gave them no answers. It was a reflex, the spasm of dumb muscle. A song of joy rises within me. Now 